Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's Tuesday. It's, oh gosh, what day is it? It's May 9th. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. There's a new Quick Bits episode that was out yesterday, a new podcast that I recorded last night that will be up for you tomorrow. The Emberling Show goes live every Wednesday. That video will be live on the YouTube channel with me in the chat. Also on Wednesday, that is covering yet more going on in the Idaho University murders case. Yes, more. There's more. And we're going over the gag order that, and well, and who's fighting against it and why they're fighting against it and the law behind fighting against it. So we're doing that today, though. Today we're talking, well, two semi quick bits. They're kind of, they're kind of quick ish bits today. It's like stream starts at 11 ish. They're quick ish bits today um, with regard to Ed Sheeran winning one of his lawsuits over his song. And then a little bit about Brittany Dawn settling and what that means and what's going on from there. Then we're going to get back into Murdoch. Bland Richter has released a press conference and more, and we're going to go over that. I have not had a chance to look at the things that they've released. They released an internal investigation that says attorney work product on it. So you bet your ass I'm curious about what that is. I want to know. So we're going to dive into it together and see. And that's going to be uh, really, really fun. So uh, replay crew, love you. Um, Mad Mandolin, <laughs> that depends on the stream but on the replay, it picks right up where I'm at. So I'm sorry if you missed the initials, ho initial hellos. Let me know where you're coming in from. My cat moved my, my camera. I can tell that he moved my camera. So during the intro, I'm going to try to pull my camera just a little bit closer because as I went live, I can see the edge of my, um, my monitor in the frame and it's making me crazy. Fred! I didn't even see him do it. <laughs> this cat, this darn cat. We should roll the intro. It Streaming with animals is one of those things. But I've got my uh, coffee. I've got my cursey words. I'm going to hope that I can fix this in the time that the intro rolls. <laughs> Replay <laughs> Love you. We're, we're, <laughs> we're professionals here. Y'all are going to summon Rob to the chat. And he's going to be like, my client is innocent. Cats. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. Pretty sure I recorded uh, the whole podcast like that yesterday and didn't notice because I was tired. <laughs> I am not tired because I was up at Taylor Swift in Nashville over the weekend. Those are crowds that I just couldn't do over the weekend. I had a quiet weekend, still a little bit tired. It's fine. It just happens. There are these seasons of life where sometimes it's great and sometimes we're just exhausted. It's the end of the school year for my kids. My kids are done before the end of May with school. So it is a very busy um, time of year. There's a lot of calendaring, which also is mentally exhausting. Is that exhausting for everybody? Maybe it's just a neurodivergent thing, but it's exhausting for me. But we had, um, we had birthdays and we got to hang out. My husband and I have birthdays over the same weekend. So we just spent time together. We went to the movies with the kids. Um, we went and saw guardians of the galaxy three. I will not spoil it other than to say, uh, I cried through almost the entire movie and walked out of the theater puffy and was like, that was not exactly what I was expecting. It's not quite quirky and fun um, the same way others are. So it's a, it's a, uh, be prepared. It's emotional. There's emotion. There's a lot of emotion. So I just, I just cried through the entire, I was not mentally prepared. I, I needed uplifting. I should have gone to see the Mario movie. <laughs> <laughs> I needed, I needed that. Just cried. It was a good movie. Just cried through the whole thing. It is not exactly, um, it, it's not Guardians 1, but it's, it wraps the story. So I'm going to just leave that there. Um, if you can't handle a movie that is going to tug on the emotions, if you're not ready for heavy, just put that one on pause, enjoy the soundtrack, but... 
I was wrecked. Not prepared. Not prepared. I was not prepared. I tried to avoid spoilers. So then I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> so I'm not going to say it's not good. Um, emotion. Lots and lots of emotion. I love seeing that I was not alone. All of you are like, yep, same. So we're going to go probably see the Mario movie. We found a new movie theater that we really like. And that's an exciting thing because we moved during COVID. And so finding a movie theater wasn't exactly wasn't exactly a top priority. So we've been experimenting um, with different theaters in the area and found one that everybody really enjoyed. So I I think we're great. Um, Alicia Long said, look up Jack Black's Peach song from the Mario movie. Uh, peaches... Peaches, 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 um, plays on repeat in my brain because my children are obsessed. My oldest for the meme of it, my youngest because he absolutely loves it. But me, when I hear peaches, I'm thinking presidents of the United States of America. I'm thinking millions of peaches, peaches for free. I'm not thinking of peaches, 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 peaches. But um, but now I am. So it's funny. I think it was I Justine who posted on Twitter just peaches, 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 peaches. And somebody was like millions of peaches. And I was like, ah, you can spot the OGs. <laughs> peaches come in a can. They were put there by a man. Oh, I one of my favorite songs by PUSA is We're Not Gonna Make It. It literally has been my theme song throughout my life since like high school, because there's definitely times where you need that song in a car and you're just like, we're not going to make it. That song works for everything from like pushing the E on your gas tank to like trying to finish a project to trying to get to bed before 1 a.m. after recording a podcast personal experience. So it's just it's just so good. So much. So much. Hmm. The coffee is hot this morning. Let me know where you're coming in from and what you are drinking. It is getting to that time of year where my office is hot again. I'm going to find my, I'm going to have to find my fan again and start turning it on in here. Cause now we're at that, like we're in that strange time where half of my house is still cool from overnight, but half of my house is getting warm and it's, it's, this is probably more information. And then if I deign to blow dry my hair, I'm probably going to sweat for the next three hours. More information than any of you needed, but I know a lot of you can relate, right? It's like, do I have time to blow dry my hair? It's getting towards summer. Blow drying my hair means that I will sweat. <laughs> this is delightful information all of you wanted to know. No, you're like, Emily, can we talk about Brittany Dawn? Yeah, we can. Let me go pull up the actual court documents. I've only seen a few media reports on this, not very many, truly. And I was kind of surprised by that, but it was like, as it was getting ready to go to trial, people were like, hey, this is getting ready to go to trial. And then everybody was like, oh, it's not going to trial. So I'm going, for those of you that didn't follow along with the case, that's fine. Let me just pull up my drive. I'm going to give a quick road so far. And then you already know the punchline. Like, spoilers in this one, it's settled. We don't know the terms of the settlement. It's a civil case. That's annoying. Um, and we have lots of other cases to catch up on. But I'm trying to do them as they pop back up in the world. I'll be doing um, Britney Spears because it's coming up for a court date. So I'll be going back and catching up on that. Next week, we'll be peeking in on the insurance case for Amber Heard, maybe later this week, depending. So it's now trying to like trying to figure out what we're catching up to, when, where, and how. So I guess it counts as a quick bits because we're doing two and they're sort of quick. So, I mean, kind of quick bits. Quick bits. Quick bits ish. <laughs> Quick bits ish ish. Are any of you are some of you at least familiar with Britney Dawn? Should we put up a poll? Like, have you heard of who Britney Dawn is? Let's do that poll. Have you heard of Britney Dawn? Yes, no. And I'm interested to see how many of you have, have heard of this person. It's not somebody that I followed, but probably because Britney Dawn was a fitness influencer. I think the only person who I would categorize as a fitness influencer that I co uh, that I follow is the fitness marshal because Caleb is amazing. His dancing is amazing and he's funny as fuck. <laughs> and he's just, and he's just, he's so great and I adore him. So, um, I think in the fitness influencer realm, that's about it. It's not really my, my world of like following fitness influencers. Normally I'm just like, 
oh yeah, I should do that. Though in May, I decided to take on a 30 day walking challenge because the YouTube algorithm served me a bunch of 30 day, like I walked for 30 day videos and I was like, oh, that seems like I could do that. That seems like a thing to do in May. So I decided to do that. So former fitness influencer sued by the state of Texas mm -hmm, for false, misleading or deceptive acts. Ages ago, I went through this complaint and the false marketing. This complaint was filed in February 2022. So I went through it back in February 2022, shortly after it came out. The attorney general sought a preliminary injunction against Brittany Dawn to stop her from selling fitness or nutrition plans, representing that she has special knowledge or training to address eating disorders when she does not. Yes, she was preying on people with eating disorders, saying that she was somebody who could help them treat their eating disorder. Look, if ED is something that you deal with, find a professional, not an Instagram influencer. Now, if you have a circle of people who feel like they are uplifting to you and like a safe space, that's great, but also medical professionals, um, medical professionals. But I love watching an inspirational story and I think there's nothing wrong with following something along. But if someone is taking your money saying, I can fix this, um, I understand why the state of Texas was like, actually, no, you fucking can't. And then charging shipping fees for goods that were delivered digitally. So she was charging shipping fees for things that were digital delivery. And then they also were seeking monetary damages, $10,000 per violation and up to $250,000 for depriving money from customers over 65. There was a Facebook group that was calling out her deceptive practices, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems to be how it came to the attention of the state of Texas. She has now shifted and is selling other types of things. I believe she's in the religious influencer space, also a space that I don't, that I'm not in like at all. So there she is now shifted, it seems to be into the religious influencer space. It kind of reminds me of when Rachel Hollis shifted really hard into the like, hey, we're doing marriage retreats while their marriage behind the scenes was falling apart. I I always worry. The influencers that I like to watch or the YouTubers that I like to watch, I tend to prefer um, people who talk about something that they know about. TechTube and, um, you know, people who clean cars and rugs. <laughs> power wash sidewalks, but I also really enjoy slice of life. I still love a good vlog. I know it's like 2016 over here. I like seeing how people make their coffee in the morning, but I'm not looking to any of these people as my guru to fix my life because I'm looking at it because I'm like, oh, how do you, how do you do that? How do you cook that? How do you, how do you make that? Like what, what coffee machine are you using? I want to see how other people live a little bit. And I love that slice of life. And I love a YouTuber who will do like, I experimented with this for 30 days or I experimented with that for 30 days. Amy Van Dyken has started sharing her stories on YouTube about going from being an Olympic athlete to becoming paralyzed, her accident, the types of, of fuckery that she deals with in day-to-day -day life from other people and the reason why you shouldn't like park in handicap spaces in case people didn't know what they were for and things like that. I love people sharing experiences that are their own that are different to me. I feel like we learn a lot that way. So, and sometimes I find things just funny. I follow a lot of comedians because I love a giggle and then a bunch of Bravo accounts. So it's this, I get this though, because I can't, this is more Emily. This is more information. I know it's not going to be quick today. I understand this though, because I also came from the online entrepreneur space and a lot of these business practices you can see play out in the online business space and the MLM space and the network marketing space. You can see these things play out in other spaces. So I completely understand how people end up being like, this is the thing that's going to help because I understand that in like the business coaching space. I understand that in the, like the YouTube coaching space, you see some that are fantastic, but then you see some and they're like, I had one video hit a hundred thousand views once, and now I'm going to charge you money to teach you how to do it. And what they say is, well, I did this. You should do that. That's not business coaching. That's not YouTube coaching, but I've seen this in different spaces. So when it comes to taking people who are vulnerable, whose health is at risk, 
who might feel like they don't have anywhere else to turn and they've got a parasocial relationship with you and then taking their money, telling them you have training to help them when you don't, preys on people in a way that does not feel good to me. And I just, bleh, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. So, oh, I have to, I have to, I saw a super chat that totally grabbed my attention. Uh, two, two, real quick. Runs with scissors. I'm glad to have a warning about Guardians. I was going to see the movie tonight after my pondered passed this morning. No. Runs with scissors. I am here for you. No. No. This talks a lot about, there's a lot of animals in this movie. Um, this is not the time. This is not the time. Um, go watch, go watch Pitch, per Pitch Perfect or something else. Something happier. Go watch Guardians 1 again. Th th this is a hard pass for a hard day. I am sorry for the loss of your lovely Pawnard. Mario would work. Um, may, did anybody see um, Dungeons and Dragons? Maybe that. But chat will chat will steer you in the right direction. But oh dear God, please not. No, not Guardians right now. Give Guardians a little bit of space on that for sure. So yes. Also, Jason, happy graduation. Congratulations. Um, a, thank you for gifting memberships. That is so very kind. And cheers on your graduation. It's that time of year. It's very nice. So it's a very nice time of year and very fun. Chat, you guys are the best. Thank you for rallying for our friends to give, to give you, <laughs> to give you the idea. D and is a good option. Uh, Mario is a good option. You need, you need some escapism and you're not going to get that right now at guardians. So I'm going to leave that there. Um, so, okay. Where were we? Brittany Dawn. So Brittany Dawn got sued by the state of Texas for the marketing practices. It was a civil lawsuit. This was gearing up to go to trial on the 15th of this month when we saw two notices filed of settlement. So here's what we've got from the state. Emily, share your screen. Um, They did not kill off Rocket, Trisha. Sorry. Oh, gosh, that's a spoiler. No, they didn't. That's the last spoiler. We're going to try to not spoil, but it deals a lot with his backstory, which is traumatic as one can imagine. And that is in the previews. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, this is from the state of Texas from 428 that please be advised that the parties have reached a mediated settlement. So they went to mediation on this and reached a settlement just before trial. At this time, we are asking that the trial date be vacated and the case be set for hearing on a motion for entry of judgment, which will be filed in the next two weeks. When we get the motion for entry of judgment, we will know some more about what was settled here and how. We also got another notification from JAMS. JAMS is a mediation service, not like Gem and the Holograms. JAMS, the mediation service. On April 25th, the parties and their counsel on the above referenced case participated in a mediation session. I'm pleased to inform you that they successfully resolved their dispute. It's been a pleasure serving you, your court, and the parties in this matter. If I may be of further assistance, please advise. And that's from the mediator that works with jams. Oftentimes, these are retired judges that do this. Um, so this has resolved after mediation. I imagine that there will be some fines. And I imagine that Brittany Dawn will be required to stay away from certain types of endeavors because that's what they were seeking the injunction for. So there will be a hearing on the final disposition on June 2nd. I'm going to put it in my calendar um, so that I can check back in. I will check back in if we learn the terms of the settlement in the final judgment, because if Brittany Dawn is required to not do certain things, which is mostly what this is going to be because they were seeking that injunction for the things I listed out. I imagine they're going to settle for some amount of money and for those injunctions. Um, so they're going to have those things in the settlement. And again, for Brittany Dawn, it will save the tremendous expense of going to court. So only 21% only of you had ever heard of Brittany Dawn. It's okay that it's not your part of Instagram. But when it comes to influencers, and this is why I was interested in following this, when it comes to influencers who market improperly, you can end up in a world of hurt. And Brittany Dawn, I imagine, is going to give some of the same things like we got from Elizabeth Holmes, like 
but this is how people did it. Like I, like in the, in the online space, there are a lot of people who will call themselves coaches of various kinds, but not have any training or experience that qualifies them for that. Cause online, anybody can be like, Oh, you know, for five 99, here's this course on this. And the law hasn't caught up to that yet, but is starting to, this feels very like circa 2017, 2018 online marketing tactics. And that still goes on where people build an audience and then start selling them trainings. But there are people who have experience who are business coaches who uh, sell things that have a tremendous amount of value. And it's really sometimes difficult to parse out what's real. And this is very much a problem in the online space that's going to continue to grow. I've been reading a ton of articles and I'm very interested in how legal is going to deal with AI. So if you're interested with me, I will bring more of that into my content. If you're not, I'm going to keep noodling on this on my own and going to conferences that talk about this because how legal deals with AI is fascinating to me. How do you deal with who owns the copyright to a song that AI created? How do you deal with voice and likeness rights if AI can create the voice of Britney Spears singing a Christina Aguilera song and it goes viral on TikTok and then somebody tries to sell the song, but those are that's her voice, but it's not her. So when it comes to likeness and voice rights, that's not really copyright, but then does Britney Spears have to go all over the world spending money to sue people who might be making these AIs? And who do you sue? Do you sue the person who programmed it? Do you sue the company? Do you sue the person who like typed in, you know, Britney Spears singing Genie in a Bottle or whatever? So there are all of these questions with regard to AI, but they're going to allow really scams like this to just be perpetuated, but they're going to remove the person who's perpetrating the scam or can one step. And so it's harder, at least with Brittany Dawn, you see the face or at least supposedly see the face of the person who's selling you the thing and know who they are and can research their background a little bit. When it's AI, you don't always know. So when we're dealing with these issues, trying to figure out how the law is going to handle them and who's going to have to spend the money to bring these lawsuits is very interesting and it's going to continue. And the chat's like, wouldn't that fall under likeness rights, but how do you enforce it? And against who do you enforce it against? Cause some of it does, but likeness rights, here's the thing. Okay. We're going to swoop real quick. We're going to talk about likeness versus copyright. The thing likeness rights off our state by state copyright is federal. So in a state like California, you're going to be able to enforce likeness rights in a much better way than some other jurisdictions that might not have rules against likeness rights. So if the person programming the AI lives in a state where likeness rights aren't well protected, what do you do? Because not likeness rights are widely varied state to state. And while states that have heavy entertainment industries, um, I haven't looked at Tennessee's, but New York and California have more um, more laws regarding likeness rights. Some states don't. And how do you deal with that? So these are the things that we will we will be looking into and that I'm very, very interested in because also enforcing this internationally, even enforcing trademarks and copyrights internationally is difficult. I was just reading that Hermes lost their um their battle over their signature boxes and the color of their signature boxes i think in japan so even though you might have something trademarked in the us doesn't mean you can enforce that trademark in brazil or in canada or in you know scotland it, it you just the the laws are different and then is it up to the person to go sue is it up to a britney spears to go sue and that's difficult too and then you get into the issue of scams, right? It's not just all fun, I have hair in my mouth. It's not all just fun mashups on TikTok and music that are being sung by different people. You're also now starting to get AI that can call your bank and pass the voice checks at your bank to verify that it's you. Or you, you remember um, years ago, when it was a very common scam 
that someone would get an email from an email address that had been taken over being like, oh my God, I was traveling abroad and I got robbed and I lost my wallet. Can you go ahead and forward me this much money to this place? And it was all a scam by email. Well, now people can do that by phone call and call your parents using your voice and say, oh my God, I'm traveling abroad and, and I lost my wallet and I need help. Or, oh my God, somebody has taken me or worse. So now with voice, how easy it is to voice mimic, it's not just your banks, but it's also extorting other people. And that's a huge issue too. So now, because we have a generation of kids, especially when we're looking at like teens and college age kids, where so much of them is online. And so you can find their voice and you can easily program AI with what's available online. And you don't have to say, who you are. So now you need to have, yes, uh, Aaron in the chat said it exactly. You need to have a family password. So you know that it's them, which is also scary, but yeah, you need to have authentication codes. So, you know, this is where we're at now where you actually need to have passwords with your family. And it's not just if you have, you know, elder relatives that might not know it's time to have a conversation with them too. So, um, Melissa said they're worried about cheating with AI on school testing. School testing is like the least of my worries at this point. I'm much, much more concerned about security, um, deep fake adult content that can be used to harm people. And I'm much worried about it as we get into, um, an election cycle where the deep fakes are so good that you never know. I mean, though, if we end up in an election cycle with people that we've seen run before, I mean, is there really going to be anything new that we haven't seen? I don't know. But for election cycles to come and for smaller races, I worry. Um, I worry how this will be leveraged against people, um, you know, where you have particularly younger people and then a photo surfaces of them that may or may not be real. Uh, it's it's concerning. So these are my concerns. I love embracing technology as it moves forward. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's great. But I also think we all need to have a healthy awareness of where it cannot be so great and really, um, really understand the way people who are going to take advantage are going to use these technologies and figure them out first. And that is really interesting. So when we talk about having kids on social media, this is one of the things we don't talk about much is that it's much easier to then generate their face and their voice to use for uh, illicit purposes and nefarious purposes against their parents. So it concerns me, but that all got very far afield of Brittany Dawn, but I can see the rise of the AI influencer, right? Where they're, they're kind of tailored because if you can just, if you can just like cookie cutter, like copy and paste, make influencers, you can make the same person or the same influencer selling a similar thing for every demographic you want to target, because it doesn't have to just be one person. It can be uh, cookie cutters with slight variances of uh, age and background and race and whatever else that you want to target people and use that to sell. Um, so we're going to start seeing, I think, more of that. And that's a really interesting thing. I also worry what it will do is we have more AI that looks more realistic to body image, to standards of beauty as we continue to see that stuff shift with filters and not filters. Remember when filters were just like dog ears and a tongue and they were all so fun as opposed to actually changing the way the fuck people look. So with all of that, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry and sorry with all of that. We have taken a, a quick bit into AI, but it's one of the things I've been really fascinated by with, um, with my legal learning, like where does the law go with this next is one of the things where I've been putting my brain power towards, um, when I'm not creating content here. So yes, I mean, it's all, it's all fun and games when I'm not a cat, right? That stuff I love. Cause you can tell and you know, um, so I love a good EDB sidebar. Thank you. We definitely took a sidebar for a minute there, but that's, that's what we're here to do. We're here to have a chat on the stream and we've been covering so much content. It feels like sometimes there hasn't been breathing room. All right. Mm. Did Swoop do a documentary on 
Brittany Dawn, if Swoop did a documentary on Brittany Dawn, I'm sure it's excellent. Swoop does great breakdowns. So if Swoop covered Brittany Dawn and you're curious now to know more about it, go watch Swoop. I don't know if uh, Cruel World, Happy Mind, Cruel, yes, I think that's right. I don't know if um, if she did one as well, but there are a couple channels that do really great research. So taking a look at those will give you, if you are curious, if you're like, if you're like me and you see an apology video show up in the algorithm and then you're just like, oh, what did they do? And then you go all the way down, um, all the way down the rabbit hole. <laughs> this might be the time to go all the way down the rabbit hole. Um, Emily is elected to save us from AI. I, I don't, I haven't elected to help save us, Mary Jane. I'm hopefully here to help navigate because it's one of the things that we are going to have to navigate in the world of like legal, not legal, what is legal, where the law can catch up and put, we have a lot of brain power here where we can have conversations about these things, about how to embrace technology and the changes in technology, but also, also put boundaries around it of what's okay and what's not okay. And oftentimes with new technologies, the boundaries get pushed pretty far before, um, before we get there. So. I do love a good dramatic video, a good uh, dramatic apology. But then if I see them, I have to go see what happened. And um, I have to go know then. I have to go down the rabbit hole of the scandal, which is the thing with making an apology video. It's like if you apologize, there are going to be people who find the apology and don't know who you are. And then they're going to be like, ooh, T, what? I also love the – and this was something Rick Bateo and I talked about when we when we got to have lunch. I talked about that lunch a while back. But he was talking about really enjoying like the entire genre of quitting YouTube videos. And I was I was like, interesting. And so I watched a couple. I was like, oh, these are fa <laughs> these are fascinating. So I've Streisand affected like um, uh, apology videos, quitting YouTube videos. I'm just so interested in seeing how those things go. So apology video Streisand effect. Sure. Um, we did a, at one point we did the YouTube apology video, March Madness bracket. I will have to go look up who won, but we, Laura Lee's video was in there. Um, there, it, when we took all of them, I put all the apology videos that were still on the internet on a playlist and we kind of ran them off against each other. It was a lot of fun. It's cause there was drama going on at the time and we're like, you know what? Let's just do all of this together. Let's just do all of this together. All right, let's talk about Ed Sheeran, shall we? Shall we? There's a, there's much to be done and much to be said. Okay, did I just wipe off all of what? Whatever. We're gonna lip gloss again after we drink coffee. Let's talk about Ed Sheeran, shall we? Have you guys been following that Ed Sheeran was in trial? Maybe you have. Maybe you haven't. Did I cover this? No. Do I love a good music case? Yes. So with Ed Sheeran. He's been sued twice, and this I didn't know till I started diving into the research of this case. And Miguelina, we can end the Britney Dawn poll and go to, have you been following the Ed Sheeran case? Or I'll just end the poll. Um, because a lot of you had not heard of Britney Dawn. But Ed Sheeran was sued over thinking out loud. He was sued for allegedly ripping off Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On. I... Um, I don't hear it with these songs. Sometimes I hear the songs and I'm like, okay, I get it. This one, I just don't hear it. And it seemed like the plaintiffs in this case that sued and the case that went to trial were plaintiffs from the um, co-writer Ed Townsend's family. There's another lawsuit from an investment group that owns another part of Ed Townsend's rights to Let's Get It On. So there's two different groups of parties coming from the co-writers copyrights in let's get it on it was being sued for copyright infringement over bars and chords and elements of the music and we've talked about this in multiple cases about how many how many progressions there are in music and how original some of them are or aren't um because we're not talking about the lyrics we're talking about, oh, did Rick Pateo do a video on this one? Go watch his video. <laughs> I'm sure it's excellent. But there's only so many chords in music, right? And 
so it's whether the chords and instrumentality are really original and there are copyrights and lyrics and copyrights and music. This is not a copyright over lyrics, which we saw a bit in the uh, Shake It Off lawsuit with Taylor Swift. So the player's going to play, play, play. We saw some of that in that lawsuit that we covered a while ago. So this is getting into the chords, the rhythm, and the melody of the song, not the lyrics. Two different lawsuits. One went to trial. This went to trial and leaned heavily into the fact that Ed Concert, Ed Sheeran had mashed up Thinking Out Loud with Let's Get It On. And that's really what the plaintiffs seemed to rely on is that Ed Sheeran had played these songs as a mashup together um, in court or not in court, in concert. But without getting into the performance rights of songs and playing covers live in concert and that, this is not uncommon that artists will cover other artists in concert or mash songs up or or modify their songs so it blends more naturally. I mean, Thinking Out Loud and Let's Get It On are both songs on the same thematic lines. I'm not surprised that they mash it up, and it's probably delightful to those that are there live in concert. I would, I think I'd be pissed at this point if I went to a Dave Matthews concert for the summer. I mean, not just one show, but in my course of going to the summer, and I didn't hear him playing Sledgehammer. It has now become one of my favorite covers that he does, that and All Along the Watchtower, but I'd be pissed at this point. I love his cover of Sledgehammer. I love when they weave in other music and you're listening to a song you know and all of a sudden the interlude changes to a different song that is not the band's and it's delightful that's the thing with live music so i love live music and that's one of the reasons it's fun so ed sheeran won his lawsuit the jury came back in just a handful of hours and it shows that just because you do the mashup doesn't mean you're and you're going to end up losing your case. And I think it's probably a good thing because the musicality on this song is not so unique. And the musicality, depending on the musicality or the four chord progression that they're really suing over in in um, Let's Get It On, is also not so unique that other songs can't use it. And if it's not so unique, it can't be copyrighted. Because again, there are only so many chords in the world and it's not a direct ripoff. This is different than other songs where artists have said, oh yeah, no, we're, we're using that song. Okay, then you need to pay licensing to use it. If you're sampling a song, you need to pay licensing to use it. So I think my favorite part about this entire trial is that Ed Sheeran grabbed a guitar and sang to the jury in this trial. Can you imagine being on that jury? Can you imagine being on the jury when Ed Sheeran just busts out a guitar and sings to you in trial? Like, when does that ever happen? <laughs> just, just bust it out and sang to the jury. Just, you see how close the jury box is to the, to the witness stand? Can you imagine? I can picture him the, the way that this trial should have been televised. I can picture him just turning to the jury with a guitar and just singing to them. If I knew that was going to happen, might I have gone to court to watch it? Maybe. But this is the problem with it being in federal court is we will never get to see it. But I think it's it's great that that's what his attorneys chose to do. And he he also said in his testimony that if he had ripped off Let's Get It On, that why would he ever mash them up in concert to point that out? And ultimately, him mashing up the two songs did not win the day. And that is, that's really fantastic. Because again, this is a very different situation from like my humps and poopsie slime surprise, right? This is not the same thing. Go listen to the songs. I would play them, but I'd instantly be demonetized and they might actually cut the stream in the middle um, because YouTube gets real, real picky about music, but go watch them. And if Rick did a video on it, um, go watch Rick's video about it. We will link it down below. Mingalina, if you'll just grab it. Um, we will link Rick's video down below too. He breaks down music better than anyone I've ever seen. Because, well, because he understands all the things of music that I don't understand. I play drums. I am not a gifted musician. I don't understand all of the things. So go listen to an expert talk about it. But I'm happy to see 
that Ed Sheeran won. And it it's not to say you can't use other people's copyrighted material. There is a legal way to do it. You can't just go ahead and do it. All right. Um, so with all of that, those were our quick bits. They seemed pretty quick, right? 40 minutes in. I did have a oh, I did have a sidebar about AI. Oh well, we're gonna go talk about Murdaugh, right? Do you guys have any more questions about about um Ed Sheeran before we get into Murdaugh? I'll take a look. Um, really enjoyed watching Rick's thoughts. I enjoy Rick's videos a lot. I my husband, he is my husband's favorite YouTuber, which I told him. He is my husband's favorite YouTuber. Um, hands down, because again, Dr. B likes to learn something. I love learning something when I watch YouTube, whether it's how people, you know, what do people eat for lunch? Because cooking lunch is always a pain point of mine or understanding music and chord progressions and the difference between them and what is unique and what's not unique. And at the end of the day, if, if you wrote in a book, like, good morning, the sun has risen and somebody else was like, that's plagiarism. What really? It, I don't know if that sentence is so unique that it can even be protected in that context of its own. Humans have written these words before, but what happens if chat GPT plagiarizes it? Who do you sue then? Mm -hmm. All right. All of it, all of it aside, go, go watch Rick. <laughs> Emily, what's your takeaway for this? Go watch Rick. <laughs> let's go, let's go find Rick's channel real quick. Um, I saw some of you saying I was pronouncing Rick's last name wrong. I might, I might be pronouncing it wrong. I might absolutely, uh, I might absolutely do that. So apolo apologies to Rick and to everyone else who's, who's like, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, I, I very well might be. Um, let's see. B is it, uh, Beato? Yeah. Instead of Bateo. I, I, yep. Yeah. In my brain, it's just stuck the way it's stuck. Okay, let's go to Rick's channel real quick and see. Ugh, ugh, where, uh, it's gotta be up here real quick. Update, Ed Sheeran versus Marvin Gaye lawsuit. Well, I'm glad there was an update. I'm sure there is another video. Oh, we talked about AI too. Rick and I need to chat. It's been too long. Um, Let's see. So I'm sure you can just go search it because uh, there's actually a little search here. And then you can find the videos. So there's the two videos. Theft or influence, Ed Sheeran versus Marvin Gaye lawsuit. Let's compare. And that was four years ago. Um, Ed Sheeran won. What's the lesson? One day ago, a live stream. So Rick's got a couple different, different videos on that. But this lawsuit is not done. Because there's still a second part to it. Uh... I wonder if it'll settle now because there is a second lawsuit from different plaintiffs over the same song. So I wonder if that part will settle. I'll be keeping an eye on it and seeing if it does because it's very possible that now that this trial is lost, the other plaintiffs aren't going to want to spend the money to go to trial, right? Let's go to Murdaugh and then we'll get to questions. K1, first live, welcome on your first live. Alan said, as a professional musician, there's a fine line between inspiration and influence and straight up stealing of musical progressions takes the Queen versus Vanilla Ice case. Queen versus Vanilla Ice is one of those cases where if you're just hearing the first, the beats, you maybe can't tell which song it is. And that is a huge problem. And this is why you should just, if you're, if you're grabbing or sampling a song, license it. Pay the people who wrote the song. Pay the people who created the um, created that music. But trying to prove that somebody was inspired by is going to break down to how much it sounds like the thing. I didn't find these things sounding that much alike, and neither did the jury at the end of the day. Are these things similar enough? Because again, it's like, well, everybody's obviously heard. Let's get it on. So are we gonna are we gonna pretend that Ed Sheeran has never heard? Let's get it on. Um, blurred lines was pretty obvious. And some of them are. Some of them you hear it and you're like, bitch, please. <laughs> I know exactly what, I know exactly what, um, exactly what song that is. So, all right. Um, Mary Jane said, I never know which song it is. Vanilla Ice totally changed how I hear under pressure. And that's, that's more of a problem. All right. Let us go. Is... Rick Beato on YouTube. Yes, 
He is. And we will link those videos down below. Um, and thank you to those who pointed out I was embarrassing myself and pronouncing Rick's name wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Rick. Um, Kaylee Wilcox just graduated from University of Michigan with my BS in dental hygiene. Congratulations. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for getting me through studying for boards and finals. Congratulations and enjoy, enjoy your career in dental. Um, just remember your patients can't always answer you back. <laughs> I love hygienists. I love that they are so gifted at just having a chat. Um, Miss Oglaw, good to see you. Thank goodness I'm sitting in another waiting room. Thankful for something to listen to. Glad to be here for you. You are always welcome, friend, and it's good to see you in the chat. Blake said music cases are so stupid they don't have a copyright for the chord progression. This is a very common one that's even in guitar books. So, Blake, I would just hasten to say some music cases are so stupid. Some are needed because they are blatant ripoffs. Like, I would just say maybe the Poopsie Slime Surprise. Um, so... Let's see. This is Nan uh, Nanny. I'm grabbing it before Nightbot Nightbot does. <laughs> is this because he didn't ask permission? Because it definitely has music from Let's Get It On. The jury found that this was not not a copyright infringement. So the jury finding it's not copyright infring infringement says to me that either the jury did not find that it was um unique enough to be copyrighted or that they weren't the same so ed sheeran um is not liable for copyright infringement in this case let's not let's get it let's get it on emily don't even try you'll embarrass yourself let's get to murdaugh where did my notes go let's let's go let's go there there is, um, we're mostly going to be going to social media for this one because we're going to look at the bland Richter press conference. Do you guys want to do the press conference first? Should we just roll the video first and I'll finish my coffee while we watch the press conference? And then we'll go to, I said that weird, then we'll go to the report that they released on their website. I think that's a good way to go. I think the press conference first. So let's swoop. On. We are back talking about the Alec Murdaugh insurance case. Last Thursday when I covered this, I was like, what? Murdaugh said in his response to his insurance company that his former housekeeper who also helped raise their children, Gloria Satterfield, did not in fact trip over dogs going up the stairs and fall backward and hit her head that caused her death, that he in fact lied about that and made up the story about the dogs because it was part of him perpetrating, well, the the response is essentially that yes he perpetrated insurance fraud against his insurance company by telling them that she was not working at the location by telling them that she tripped over dogs and fell and then taking the insurance payout for himself and his friends after gloria satterfield passed at the very end should we just pull it up again because it's so fucking outrageous um should we just pull up again what he said about joining in Gloria Satterfield's children. I think we just need to refresh our recollection as we do this road so far. He said in his response through his lawyers that Eric Bland, Ronnie Richter, Bland Richter, the law field, Tony Satterfield individually and in his capacity as the personal representative of the estate and Brian Harriet have recovered over 7.5 million by means of an action in South Carolina Court of Common Pleas for Hampton County. We're going to cover that. It was going to be today. We're going to cover that another day, maybe in the podcast, but we're going to cover that underlying case. But then this happened and now we had to, now we're going back here. Based on allegations that the defendant converted a payment from Nautilus and a smaller payment from Lloyd's of London that should have gone to the Satterfield estate. If Nautilus never should have made the payment to the Satterfield estate, this is his argument. This is Alex's argument because he's going scorched earth on this shit. If Nautilus, the insurance company, is arguing that they never should have paid out the Satterfield estate, and they probably shouldn't have because it seems that Gloria Satterfield was there in a work capacity and there's a specific exclusion on the insurance for what would be a worker's comp situation. So it might be that Nautilus never should have paid out the estate of Gloria Satterfield. So they're arguing 
Murdaugh is arguing if Nautilus never should have made a payment to the Satterfield estate and only did so because it was the victim of fraud, insurance company the victim of Alex fraud, then the parties in possession of a recovery of money stolen from Nautilus are necessary parties. And he's saying the parties in possession of that are Eric Bland, his law firm, and the Satterfield boys. Right? And so he is asking the court to bring in Bland Richter, the law firm, and Gloria Satterfield's sons, saying that if I never, if they never should have been paid for fraud, then they can't sue me for stealing the money from Gloria Satterfield's estate because it never should have been paid to them. It's like, okay, okay. If I, if the estate never should have been paid by insurance, then they can't sue me for stealing the insurance money. So bring them in. It's gross. It might not be legally inappropriate, and this is where legality and morality come in, but it's gross. And I'm really interested to see what Bland Richter has to say about it. So we're going to go to their press conference. I don't know why they do these things on Facebook. Eric Bland. If you streamed this on YouTube, hear me out. If you streamed this on YouTube, A, your message would get out further. B, I've got you. Look, I use StreamYard. Super easy setup. You don't have to rely on Zoom. It starts when it's supposed to start. It gives you a little live counter. You can see how many people are and you can interact with the chat. I've got you. Like we can, we can, we can level this up. Just if you're ever interested. Unsolicited advice. I know. But as a as a lawyer who's who's used to being on the YouTubes, stop doing these things on Facebook. Put them on the YouTube. Just put them on the YouTube. Let's go to this press conference and take a look. All right. I know, I know not all of you, not all of you love Eric Bland. He's been on every, every media outlet um, talking about this, and that's going to rub some people the wrong way. I think he is trying to represent the Satterfield boys to the best of his ability, and part of that is getting all of this out into the media. Uh, I can ask. I don't know if he will. He's been all over the place. Eric has been on other panels with StreamYard, I think. I want this to be done, not on Zoom. So he is, he's absolutely a zealous advocate. And this is him, him getting this story out there is part of representing his clients. And that's how I see it. All right. But I understand. I mean, everyone I talk about, there are going to be people who don't like, I get it. So this is, what's interesting to me is that Whitney McDuff is from somewhere called Speaker Consulting. It's interesting that she seems to be facilitating this press conference um, with Eric Bland and Ronnie Richter, the partners of Bland Richter. Is that a sword? I'm kind of digging the sword. I'm not going to lie. I'm just saying, with StreamYard, this could be a bit of a smoother experience. Oh, got one more. There's John. Okay. Right. And then you don't have to start live streaming until everybody's in. You All right. Know, good morning, everybody. More thank control. you for joining us. We want to thank you for tuning in this morning. If you could please turn off your cameras and your microphones, we are going to be taking questions via the chat after our announcements. We're here to discuss developments See, this is why surrounding you just the ongoing lawsuit do it on, between Alex do it on and Nautilus Insurance Company. Our goal here is to provide clarity. I'm going to let the rest of these people in. And then you don't have to, you can. Our goal here is to provide got, you all with some clarity, provide some insight Emily. and some resources Shush. that you all Shush. will need to be reporting on the story. Um, this morning, we've got attorneys Eric Bland and Ronnie Richter, who represent the Satterfield family. They are going to be available for questions and releasing internal documents and audio files related to the case. Oh, um, audio we'll start files. Start us off with a statement from Ronnie. Ronnie, I'll let you take the floor. Thank I'm very so interested to hear that. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, Eric Bland, my partner, and I thought it was important today that we address the latest misinformation campaign that's been launched by T. Murdoch and that and I appreciate the transparency I do and I think it's needed um I think it's needed so I I think it's interesting that they're calling the Murdoch's filings a misinformation campaign because 
here's the thing is Murdaugh lying about lying. And I'm very interested to hear what the attorneys from Bland Richter have to say. Emily, then why are you pausing? Because we're giving commentary. I'm going to gain him up a little bit. And I appreciate that at least it has false some narrative that's been advanced through the pleadings in the Nautilus, lo Nautilus lawsuit at the bottom and clear the fog once and for all about what we know about how Gloria died at Mazelle. Okay. So on May, on May 1st, 2023, as you know, Alex Murdoch filed an answer in the Nautilus lawsuit. Uh, oh, do we know? The answer in the lawsuit is what we were just looking at um, and what we were just talking about because that answer is where Alec Murdoch says publicly, I made up the story about the dogs. Which lawsuit seeks to recover from Alex the $3.8 million that it paid in settlement of Gloria's case? In short, what Nautilus contends is that it paid the money in, to Alex in trust. Because uh, he lied. Upon fraud. False statements or false pretenses that were Far, advanced based by on Alex fraud. Murdoch. Mm -hmm. Now, incredibly, in answering the lawsuit, Murdoch claims now for the first time that he, quote, invented the critical facts giving rise to the Satterfield claim and that no dogs were involved in Gloria's death. Now, as if he has not caused enough damage to the Satterfield family, Murdoch took the additional step in the lawsuit, although he didn't have to, of suggesting by way of defense that because he... I was very interested to see how they were going to address whether or not it was his only legal defense to say that the other party should be brought in. It was my kind of gut opinion that he did not have to do that. I'm not surprised that it's also Bland Richter's opinion that Alec didn't have to argue to bring in, um, to bring in this law firm and the Satterfield sons because, but also Alec could turn around and try to counter sue them and say, Hey, if the insurance company's recovering from me and it's fraud, then I need to recover from you. But he signed the settlement of judgment, so he can't really do that. So I'm not surprised that he's trying to have the court bring them in and say they're necessary because he can't really sue them. He signed the settlement of judgment, and he can't say that that's fraudulent. Chat, I can't increase the size of the closed captioning because it is embedded in Facebook. Apologies. It's Facebook. Um, so there's... There, oh, wait, are there options? Um, oh, wait, maybe, maybe, maybe I can. Okay, I'm going to try that. Let's see if that works. Fingers crossed. Maybe. Successfully stole the money, and because that money is gone. There we go. But also because the I can't move it, though. Satterfields were successful in obtaining money from other sources that Nautilus should look to the Satterfields to get back the money that Alex stole. Now, while not parties to the lawsuit, the continued attacks on the Satterfields cannot and will not be ignored. Although Murdaugh is a well-documented liar. Ronnie, I want you to be madder. <laughs> I'm mad. I'll be mad for it. I realize it's a press conference and that you're trying to, to just deliver the facts, but it's okay to be mad. Eric and I felt it important that we address the latest false narrative through the release of internal investigative reports that were conducted at the time of Gloria's death by the attorneys who were engaged at that time to investigate those facts and circumstances. We're as gonna well go as through to those release today. the audio interview that was given by Alex contemporaneous with Gloria's death. Oh boy. Where he says in his own words, you know, how Gloria died at Mazelle that day. Now, but he wasn't there. You get these documents. Um, what the investigative report reveals are not just statements from Alex, but inter interview notes from interviews that were conducted with both Maggie and Paul. That's what I want to see. And those interviews established the following facts. Number one, on the day of Gloria's death, all four of the Murdoch's dogs were loose on the property. And that includes Bubba, who's a 90-pound Labrador retriever. Justice for Bubba. Bourbon, a 55-pound Labrador retriever. Blue, a 60 five pound Labrador don't shame blue and sassy a 25 pound German short hair so Bubba bourbon blue and sassy are the dogs that were on site when this happened oh poor Bubba Bubba's name is not going to get left out of anybody's mouth so Bubba bourbon and blue number two it was it was described in the investigative report that it was common for the dogs to quote 
get under people's feet when they came to the property. Mm. Uh, number three, Maggie in her interview described bourbon as being, quote, just horrible. Um, and, and an excited dog who is an attention-seeking dog. Uh, number four, Maggie and Paul were both asleep when Gloria arrived at the property. Number five, Maggie and Paul were both awakened by dogs barking loudly. And number six, when Maggie went to the front door, she found Gloria at the bottom of the stairs, clearly injured, bleeding from the head. So nobody she saw described it. that at the time, all four dogs were around Gloria. I don't know who Scott is on the Zoom call, but this is this is again why I'm just saying you can use other options for Zoom and they won't shift your speaker screen while you're doing um while you're doing a press conference. I don't know if the dogs are to blame here or not. On the 911 call, there is zero barking. Zero barking on the 911 call. And if nobody saw it, I mean, people do stop or people do fall on stairs. It, it happens. I don't, it sounds like nobody saw Gloria fall and they supposed that the fall was caused by the dogs because all the dogs were there. But then did they go put the dogs away before they made the 911 calls? Because on the 911 calls from the murder, when they get closer to the um, or when Alec gets closer to the kennels, you can hear the dogs in the background. They're not going wild, but you can hear occasional barking. Um, so <sighs> between Gloria Satterfield's fall and the murder of Maggie and Paul, I don't know what happened with Bubba or Blue and Bourbon. We know that Bubba was still there, but people can, accidents do happen. Now, in a separate interview, Paul stated that he was asleep uh, when he heard the dogs barking. He heard his mother call out for help. He came outside. He also found Gloria at the bottom of the stairs and injured. Paul remembers that when his dad, Alex, arrived, Alex asked Gloria at the time what happened. And Paul heard Gloria say, quote, something about dogs. All right. So that's what we know. So Gloria was somewhat conscious at some Gloria's point. Uh, Alex told the investigators at that time that the dogs came into contact with Gloria, not, not aggressively, not viciously, but maybe excitedly caused her to lose her balance and caused her to fall. Now, although since the time of, the, of Gloria's death, uh, Alex has been convicted of having murdered, you know, the two most important eyewitnesses to the case, uh, th this circumstantial evidence is powerful and it clearly establishes the manner in which Gloria died. Ronnie? Yes. Also, don't forget that after the funeral, when they were in the um, uh, home and having some food, Alex in front of the entire Satterfield and Hadwin family told um, them that the dogs caused the fall and it was in front of Maggie and Paul that he said it. So it was there as well. Yeah, and Maggie but, and Paul, by, by the silence, endorsed that statement. I understand that. But it sounds like the interviews from Maggie and Paul are the most helpful. And what they're trying to establish is that Alec didn't lie then. Alec's lying now. And Alec is saying that he lied then, which makes it a really difficult thing to unwind. But for Alec, you have to look at where is the benefit? The benefit to Alec is in lying now, but there's also an argument that the benefit to Alec was in lying then because when he lied originally, that's how he was able to get over $3 million for himself from the insurance company. But it seems to me that no one saw this fall based on the evidence here, or everyone has made up a story that no one saw the fall. I mean, that's, that's pure speculation. Based on what we have, no one saw the fall. And so that now it would appear the only person who contests the manner in which Gloria dies, died is Alex Murdoch. And he only contested in the context of now being sued. Right. By now it benefits him to, to contest recover the it. money that it had entrusted to Alex. So at the end of this press conference, I'm going to turn it over to Eric 
who's going to share some of our points of view about the case, about the claims. None. There are no the security cameras. We're going to make available to you a complete copy of that report for your own review, as well as a complete copy of the 12 minute and 45 second audio interview with Alex Murdoch, in which he describes to the investigators well, I want to hear that. how Gloria died. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. You know, um, Faulkner said about the idiot, it's full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, there's just tremendous amounts of misinformation that are constantly plowed out there by Dick and Jim and Alex. And we believe that the press and the public are being played here because legally and factually, they are 100% wrong. We recovered more than seven and a half million dollars from sources other than Nautilus Insurance Company. Nautilus Insurance Company has never paid one cent to the Satterfields, nothing. Okay, here's why that's important. Thank you, Eric Bland, because Alec is saying, look, if Nautilus never would have paid out and then that money went to the Satterfields, you need to have the Satterfields here. Eric Bland has completely just shut that theory down because the, um, the Nautilus insurance company never paid the Satterfields. So Nautilus is trying to get back the $3 million that Alex stole. They don't need Bland Richter or the Satterfield boys involved to do that at all because the Satterfield boys never got money from Nautilus. Well, that clears that up a lot. Thank you. Um, so it doesn't even help. None of this even helps other than Nautilus trying to get back $3 million from Alec that they're not going to get back either. This is why I'm glad they did a press conference. I guess we'll see it when they file their response because now they're going to have to. Um, Crispy Cookie said, so they weren't hunting dogs? I've never had a poorly behaved hunting dog. And in the murder trial, they said they were hunting dogs. They, they were trained hunting dogs. And now it's like, oh, they're just pet dogs running all over the family. It seems that that changes. Okay. The, the answer says that they gave the money to Alex Murdoch and trust. They didn't give the money to Alex Murdoch and trust. It went to Corey Fleming, who was also and then the it went to fake for the Satterfields. We recovered from PMPD, from Palmetto State Bank, from Bank of America, from Chad Westendorf, from Corey Fleming, and from Moss Coon and Fleming. Okay. For claims of breeze of duty, of aiding and abetting Alex, claims that are separate apart for what Al whatever Alex did to the Satterfields. Okay. And by the way, every one of these the target defendants had lawyers and investigators. And before they paid us that money last year, they had the absolute right to investigate from anew and start over and say, hey, you know what? This is a good question, so I wanted to get to it real quick. Sorry for the, the pause face, Eric. Who defended Alec Murdoch in the civil case? Same lawyers. Poot. Same lawyers. But we don't Jim think the Poot. dogs caused the fall. They did not do that because... Let me back up a little bit. I am very interested to learn exactly who Eric recovered from for the Satterfield family, because it wasn't Nautilus. And that is a huge part of why Eric, not Eric, of why Alec trying to pull Bland Richter and the Satterfield boys in is going to fail. From sources other than Nautilus Insurance Company. This Nautilus very Insurance important. Company has never paid one cent to the Satterfield. Then why Nothing. the fuck is Poot even arguing it if they know that? It just makes them look bad. The, the answer says that they gave the money to Alex Murdoch and trust. They didn't give the money to Alex Murdoch and trust. It went to Corey Fleming, who was also the lawyer for the Satterfields. We recovered from PMPD, from Palmetto State Bank, from Bank of America, from Chad Westendorf, from Corey Fleming, and from Moss Coon and Fleming for claims of breeze of duty, of aiding and abetting Alex, claims that are separate apart for what Al whatever Alex did to the Satterfields. And by the way, every one of these the mm -hmm. target defendants had lawyers 
right. and investigators. And before they paid us that money last year, they had the absolute right to, to investigate, investigate right. from anew and start over and say, hey, you know what? We don't think the dogs caused the fall. They did not do that because they looked into it themselves. They made decisions to settle the case that maybe had nothing at all to do with Gloria's death, but that they didn't want to be associated with Alex Murdoch. Huh. You know what isn't in Alex Murdoch's pleading? A confession of judgment to say, you're right, Nautilus Insurance Company. I stole $3.8 million from you. Here's where it is. Here's where you can find it. What he says is, I get to keep the $3.8 million, and you can look to the Satterfields. This is um, completely uh, not founded in law. It's not founded in fact. More importantly, insurance companies are not in the business of paying out millions of dollars before they do investigations. And at that time, at the fall in February of 2018, insurance companies hired investigators, adjusters, internal adjusters, third party adjusters, and they had attorneys. And determined And what? these attorneys wrote their recommendation letters to, settle. to the carrier suggesting it would be a good thing for them to settle if somebody but if that's based on alec lying and bullying them that's a little different and that's what they're alleging now he really wants to look at the origins of the nautilus money and where it went well Perhaps we know where it went. jim should add themselves as a party to the case <laughs> because because did dick and jim get paid out of that money <laughs> Dick and Jim, you might not want to ask these questions because Eric Bland's going to turn right back around and ask them. All right, let's keep this going. The money, the $3.8 million, was stolen in May of 2019. What happened around May of 2019? Paul was charged with the DUI boating accident of Mallory Beach. What did Alex and Paul do? They retained Jim Griffin and Dick Carpootlian for what we're told was $500,000. Where did that $500,000 come from? Right. Are those the ill-gotten gains from Nautilus Insurance Company? Are those the funds that Alex admitted during his murder trial that he stole? Yeah, Eric's from not going to back down to, clients? to Dick it's and Jim. It's just almost a perversion of the justice system. I like his to jacket. To suggest that the Satterfield family be victimized again to have a Nautilus insurance company who has no relationship with the Satterfields at this point in time because they never paid them a penny. And still um, haven't, it sounds More like. importantly, Dick and Jim, with all of their fancy litigation moves that they do, These just walked fancy. Alex in, if, is, if he is to be believed, to new criminal charges. Because in a pleading, it's a judicial admission, that Alex just admitted through his lawyers that he lied. I committed insurance fraud. Yep. I committed wire fraud. I committed mail fraud. Alec doesn't so give a at shit. This point in time, at this point, it can't get any worse. He doesn't care if they bring new. He's got over 101 criminal charges against him. He does not give a fuck. And I think he's probably petty as hell. So. Eric Bland's like, well, you're going to get new charges. Alec doesn't fucking care. He's never getting out of prison. Now he's being vindictive, in my opinion. So why does he give a shit? He, Alec is going to burn it down. And I think that's what this filing was, is Alec trying to burn it down. And I think Eric Bland is completely right, saying, hey, Dick, Jim, how y'all getting paid? Because we've seen the motions now where Dick and Jim are trying to get to money that is being held by the receivers to finish paying them because they haven't been paid. We just don't see um, where this gets them in any any shape or form. It's uh, it, for me, it's, mean. it's just more fog that they're trying to create, almost like it's personal that Dick and Jim want to go after us in the Satterfields. You saw the way that Dick cross-examined Tony. It was rude. Um, the time period, though, it was this is what's interesting to me. If Alex was ever going to come clean, if he was lying originally about the dogs tripping um, Gloria, 
would have been in May of 2022. What happened in May of 2022? Ronnie and I already collected more than seven and a half million dollars from all these other parties. Alex, who didn't want to be sued from us anymore, gave a judgment he did. of $4.3 million to the Satterfield. He did. Now, what, what person would permit a judgment to be given against him if he wasn't guilty? That would have been the time for Dick and Jim to stand up and say, hey, Bland, hey, Richter, you guys got money. You shouldn't even have gotten that money because our client lied. He told the truth then when he gave the judgment. And so it's hard to argue that us, someone has lied so much is telling the now truth. Alex is the, the modicum of honesty, the modicum of truth. Um, it's just more spin by him. He doesn't tell you where the money went, the, the 3.8 million. He doesn't tell you how Gloria died. And oh, by the way, everybody's saying, oh, let's exhume Gloria. Um, it's not I don't help. believe the state's going to do that because. I, though we saw reports a year plus ago that they were going to exhume Gloria, but the manner of the fall isn't going to be determined by that. Like there's nothing that exhuming her is going to help in determining the manner of the fall. She fell backwards downstairs. What caused that fall is not going to be more easily determined if they exhume her. She still has the injuries that she has to the back of her head and what have you. It's not going to help because it's not as if she didn't fall downstairs. She fell downstairs. Um, what caused her to fall is different. So, it, and she was at the hospital for... Um, for a good bit of time between the the fall and when she passed. So I don't think exhuming her is going to help, though we had seen reports multiple times that they were going to exhume her. If she's exhumed, her injuries are, still the are same. never going to be able to be told on how she died. Right. If she was pushed down the stairs, her injuries are exactly the same right. as if the dogs tripped her and pushed her down the right. stairs or if she herself tripped from the top stairs. They're not going to solve or if a she crime. she got lightheaded. And or, it's very convenient or, or. that the three people who could support or contradict Alex are, are dead. all dead. Paul, I said that Maggie, on Thursday. And Gloria. So I did say that on Thursday. For us, um, we finally felt that we've heard enough trash uh, <laughs> from that side of the camp. Is anybody else ready for Eric to just say, we're sick of this shit, leave the Satterfield boys alone? Because honestly, aren't you? Chat, are you sick of this shit? Are you also at like, leave? Their mother died on your property in 2018, and there has been nothing but, I imagine, pain and heartbreak for her boys since they discovered that the person that they trusted, whose, whose family she worked for for 20 years, like, how do you not have care for this person? She was in your home and helped raise your kids. And then you turn around and steal from her sons after they die. And they don't even know about it until Maddie, Mandy Matney breaks the story because she finds the settlement that a judge signed without even speaking to the boys, which is also unfathomable to me, but shouldn't be after everything I've seen in this case. And then from that point, they have to continue to fight with new lawyers because the person that they trusted to take care of them stole from them, allowed them to lose their home. It's absolutely disgusting. So I, I appreciate the anger here from, from Eric Bland. I know Ronnie Richter, who is a bit more subdued, I appreciate the, the righteous indignation because this is appalling at this point. Just stop. Fight the insurance company. Leave the boys out of it. You took the money from the insurance company. Go fight with them. And the Satterfield boys, the $7.5 they got was from the bank, from the two banks, from the other lawyers, from all the other people that did them dirty. Alec has confessed a judgment of four plus million dollars to them that they're probably never going to see because everyone is fighting over Alec's money at this point, including his lawyers. And uh, we had to come out and, 
and and, and show you contemporaneous evidence. We appreciate Alex, it. Alex, Maggie, and Paul gave to first responders. I'm here for the contemporaneous companies, evidence. To the Satterfield family at a time when it was more truthful to give that statement. Not at a time where Alex is already a convicted double murderer, where a jury in less than three hours in, in summary fashion rejected his testimony outright. And by the way, two weeks ago, the very same judge who's hearing this Nautilus Insurance Company case, Judge Richard Gergel, held in an order. Did he just say Judge Gergel? Because I don't know if I can deal. I'm sorry. I, I need, I got distracted. Go back, go back. What are we say? What did Judge Gergel do? Which case? Oh gosh. Okay. Emily, whew, recompose. Insurance companies to the Satterfield family at a time when it was more truthful to give that statement. Not at a time where Alex is already a convicted double murderer, where a jury in less than three hours in, in summary yep. fashion, rejected his testimony. They did too. Outright. That jury was like, and by the way, two weeks ago, the shit. very same judge who's here. Two weeks ago, this is what I wanted to hear. Me trying to. During this okay. Nautilus Insurance Company case, Judge Richard Gergel held in an order denying a motion for a new trial to Russell Lafitte that Alex Murdoch is a fraudster a habitual liar True. and has already been determined as such True. by a Carlton County jury. Russell Lafitte's judge. Okay. Thank you, Eric, so much. If you all have questions, go ahead and flip on your camera and we'll do it that way. Um, I'm interested to, to hear to the questions. Before we jump off, if not, um, Caitlin's dropped the link to these documents and this audio for you all to we're go going to go to the audio chat. next and then the documents. I'll this is what we're doing the rest of the stream and then questions. An email with those links as well. We appreciate you all attending this morning. Make sure we've got everybody. John, how are you? You got a question for us? Your mic. Your, your mic. Your mic. Your mic. There you go. Can your you mic. hear me? Yes, hey. sir. I, I have a question. It's me? really basic. I think I know the answer, but can you explain in everyday terms what difference it makes if the dogs were the cause of? Gloria's death, or she just tripped and fell herself? What is? Well, it makes a big difference uh, in theory to an insurance company because people can trip and fall on your property, and that does not make you liable as a landowner. If they tripped and fell going down the stairs and your stairs were defective. If she got lightheaded um, or had a blood pressure drop or something like that and fell on the property, it's different than if your animals trip someone on the property, which I imagine is what he's going to get into. It is a good question. We haven't even talked about it because there are things that I just, my, I just like, <laughs> my brain just zoom, zooms over. Where they were not built according to code, then yes, you could be held liable. But if I was exiting your house, John, and I walked down the stairs and because of my own neglect, I didn't or watch what I was doing, out, I tripped and fell, right? I couldn't sue you. But if you have four dogs that you know are unruly and are misbehaving and they greet people and you look at those stairs at Mazelle and you know how dangerous they are, how steep they are, and they're brick pointed stairs, then that puts a duty on you that if you're going to have visitors to your house to make sure that your, your dogs are properly restrained. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's Thanks, a good Sarah. question. I'm glad Hi. you asked it. How you doing? Yeah, Good morning, Dr. Um, question. I, I think I know the answer, but you know, based upon the exhumation comments you made, but is there any need to pursue a death investigation at this point based upon Alex's comments in his filing last week? Ronnie? No, that, that, it doesn't change anything for us. Look, the family spent three weeks with Gloria in the hospital. I mean, they're very, they're very acutely aware of how she died. And like to Eric's point, you know, the family will support law enforcement if they want to do this. But they feel like they have their answers. There's there's going to be nothing about these injuries that are going to point to one cause versus another. She fell down the stairs, she struck her head, and that was her cause of death. Thank you, Ronnie. And Jeanette, morning. Hi, 
Hi, good morning. Um, what is the what is the likelihood or I guess fear on behalf of or concern on behalf of Ronnie and Eric that Nautilus could potentially seek to claw back this money by coming after your clients? No, it's just annoying no fear as fuck. whatsoever. Wow. Um, they, they don't have a legal or factual basis to do it because the it would be like if the Satterfields won the right, lottery they're not and, wrong. and Nautilus wants to come after them for the lottery money because Alex stole the $3.8 million. If they got the $3.8 million That's that different. was paid by Nautilus, if it went through Alex and Corey and got to them, then technically, yes, they could uh, make a claim and say, you know what, we were we were fraudulently induced to do this. But again, putting aside all that, there's a, a hundred years of release and settlement law that would have to be overcome. They they did this with open eyes. They had the absolute right. Right, they're not getting investigated to investigated these. Here's Emily's answer. It's annoying as fuck that he's trying to rope them into this to make them potentially pay legal fees and Bland Richter might not charge them legal fees to deal with this fuckery. They might just say, we're handling it. You don't need to be victimized by Alec Murdoch anymore. But to try to drag them in costs them not just stress, not just an emotional toll, but can actually cost them. So that's my answer to all of it. But no, they're, Alec Murdoch is not going to recover from them. Eric Bland has made it completely clear that Nautilus never paid anything to the Satterfield boys. The person who has that money is Alec Murdoch. So the person they need to go get it back from is Alec Murdoch. And I loved Eric Bland's suggestion. Or maybe look at Dick and Jim. Hey, oh, guys, where'd you get your legal fees from? Hmm? Um, Arma asked, do the boys have a GoFundMe? The boys got $7.5 million from um, the banks that Eric Bland listed earlier here, the banks, the other lawyers and stuff. Um, so I don't think they do have a GoFundMe. I don't think they need a GoFundMe. I just think... No matter, nothing brings their mom back, right? Nothing changes the years that stress like this can take off of your enjoyment of life. Nothing changes that. But um, I think financially, if they needed to pay their lawyers for this, they could. But why should they have to? Like, it's the it's the righteous indignation of why the fuck should they have to even deal with this lawsuit between Alec and his insurance company? He lied to his insurance company. That has nothing to do with the Satterfield boys, you know? Claims, they had the absolute right to disprove and say, no, it wasn't the dogs that caused the fall. Gloria was coming to work. She comes to work every day at 10 o'clock and therefore it would be a workers' compensation claim. We have no fear. And, I, and by the way, if they do bring us in, people are going to be countersued for frivolous litigation. <laughs> I don't believe Judge Gurr. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Dick and Jim, if you would like to try to bring us in, we're going to fucking sue you. Trust. That's funny. I'm rewinding that. And say, no, it wasn't the dogs that caused the fall. Gloria was coming to work. She comes to work every Which day. Which is why it should have been workers' 10 o'clock. And therefore, it would be a workers' compensation claim. We have no fear. And, I, and by the way, if they do bring us in, people are going to be countersued for frivolous litigation. We are I don't suing believe people Judge up Burgle's in going to let anybody bring the Satterfields in. But we recovered our money for breaches of duty from others. Not from Nautilus. Yeah, and he's exactly right on that. He's though. exactly yeah, right Jeff. on that. I love that Anjanette's like, wait, I've got, I would like to have more of a discussion. I respect that me. Um, but he's exactly right on that though, is there's no reason that Nautilus has anything to go on after. Isn't Eric Bland from Boston? I'm pretty sure it's Boston, right? You can hear it. I love that Eric Bland is like, try me motherfucker. He is so done with Dick and Poot. He was done with them taking shots at him during the trial. He's done with them going after his clients. He's done. Is it Philly? Okay. He's done with Alec Murdaugh and his bullshit. He's so done with it. And I think it's helpful that Eric is not from 
like born and raised South Carolina. He has, you know, moved there for whenever or whatever, but this is not his old boys club. And he does not give a fuck who Alec Murdaugh is. And that's the kind of attorney that you need um, to face off against someone like Alec Murdaugh, right? He just doesn't care. So he, I know he talks about this on his podcast with Mandy Matney, Cup of Justice, but I was really interested to hear what he had to say in this, um, in this press conference. So he's, he's ready. Like if you, if you want to fuck around, you're going to find out he's on that chain of fuck around and find out with this. Genesis of this whole thing, you know, like, I guess. And let's go back to what Anjanette started saying. Breaches of duty from others, not from Nautilus. But, that. but that's, that's where it came from, though. You know, the genesis of this whole thing, you know, like, I guess it starts at the insurance company, though. That's why I'm, you know, wondering these. I'm sorry. No, it doesn't. Corey Fleming had an obligation to prevent Alex Murdoch from stealing their money. Per well, had an obligation to say, you know, you can't bring this claim against yep. the insurance company. That's a breach of his duty owed to our clients. No, but he had a duty more, not to act in conspiracy with Alex. More, more fundamentally. There's a signed settlement agreement in which Nautilus Insurance Company agrees to pay the Satterfields $3.8 million. That did not happen. All right, so that that payment was intercepted by Alex Murdaugh and stolen. And so legally, technically, we we never got the $3.8 million from, from uh, Nautilus Insurance Company. Now you would say, well, we're made whole by the other recoveries. We don't think that's true at all. We We think that the Satterfield claims are worth well in excess of even the money that we recovered. Yeah. Because it's not just you put the cookie back in the cookie jar. There there has to be a consequence for Sir, you can't put the shit back in the horse, but I appreciate you can't put the, the cookie back in the cookie jar. It's not just this. What happened here? And so we, we would have valued the claim far in excess of even the money that we received. So no, I, I, we don't perceive any risk here. We've not been paid that money. These two lines of money never cross. And Jeanette, just as a further explanation, I like the intervening criminal acts of a third party cut the chain of liability to the Satterfields. The intervening criminal act of Alex Murdoch, who was the insured and the target defendant, cut whatever uh, equitable argument can make can be made against the Satterfields. That's why Nautilus has sued Alex because Alex they took know the that money. He has the money. Well, and he again, Alex it. is in an, Alex is defending this case. He hasn't entered a, a judgment. He hasn't said you you got me here here it is. I'm liable. This is where the money went. He wants to keep the money. One last question from Tara. <laughs> yes. Tara, I see you up there, and then we'll we'll get this wrapped up. Thank you, everybody who's gifted memberships. Carbonized Stardust, appreciate it. Um, B2, always thank you so much. And to everyone else who gifted memberships, Very thank good. you. Okay. Uh, legally, what's next? What can we expect? Nothing from us. <laughs> uh, we're going to collect. Now, now we're going to start collecting on the $4.3 million. <laughs> They're like... We're, we're, we're waiting for them to fuck around further so they can find out, but they, I, they're, they can't really respond in court documents other than this. They're waiting for, cause the court's probably not going to bring them in. Right. So Nautilus is going to have to respond. This is their response. This is their no. So now they're like, Hey, we have a judgment against Alec time to start enforcing that judgment and trying to go find the money. Um, so now they're actually going to be fighting Nautilus to go get that money. In our judgment last week, we had a court hearing where, um, Alex's lawyers were asking for another $160,000. I wish that was streamed. From the receiver. Is that streamed anywhere? If it is, let me know. We'll cover it on Thursday. There's funds that have been marshaled by John Lay I've and covered Peter that McCoy. Too. And I argued, uh, strenuously I don't against, doubt that. uh, approving that they tried to say, well, if you don't let him get this money, then the public's going to have to pay for his appeal, which again is another red herring argument because Jim Griffin. Remember, we covered that motion and we were all like, oh, shut up. <laughs> the things we all, we all, when we covered that motion, we're like, oh, Jim, stuff it. 
You knew what you were going to get covering. You knew what you were going to get. You knew you weren't going to get paid your full fees. These attorneys, I want, you know, I wonder if like Eric Bland and Tinsley go out to drinks. What are those conversations like? I want to know. Griffin did a, 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 a de facto GoFundMe. We don't know how much money Jim Griffin raised through his uh, de Mugs. facto GoFundMe. We know that Alex uh, inherited a $4 million trust from his father. And oh, by the way, it Where's was that said money? in the press conference by Dick and Jim after he was held uh, guilty on the murder charges Found. that his family believes more than ever that he's innocent. So you know what family have to do for other family members? Cough up money, pay for his appeal. So we are we are fighting <laughs> Alex like, continuously on go, not go getting get the $160,000. Go, go get the money. We argued that the money that the receivers has will be paid in the court and then everybody will be shoulder to shoulder. All victims, all creditors will make their application and a court or a special referee will decide who gets paid. But if you let Alex get to the front of the line, then all you are doing is rewarding his theft that he admitted in his trial that he stole over $8 million from his clients. So that's what we have going on uh, right now. We continue to sue Russell Lafitte on behalf of the Plylers. And yep. um, we're, the sentencing for Russell Lafitte is probably coming up within the next six to eight weeks. Uh, Ronnie and I plan on speaking at that sentencing hearing. Our clients, uh, the, the Plyler sisters, are going to speak. And we know that we have the Corey Fleming trial coming too. up uh, of, on all days, September 11th this year. So that's kind of what the uh, calendar. If the, Clor if the Corey Fleming trial is streamed in any way, I will be covering it. I'm very interested to see what's like. We're so invested in this saga and it has tentacles, like the amount of fraud on fraud on fraud. I'm very interested to see what happens with the Corey Fleming trial. Thank you, everyone else who has gifted membership and welcome to all our new members. Um, thank you so much. It's incredibly generous and it's a great way to enjoy the community when you can. All right. And the mods will share how to turn that on on your channel so you can accept them if you haven't already. They're so great at that. Looks like. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'll send up a follow-up with links. We are here and available for questions if you have them. Appreciate y'all. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks, guys. Thank All you. All right. I'll have to, I'll reach out and ask if the Fleming trial will be streamed. Okay. That I removed the wrong thing. I removed myself from the stream. All right, let's go listen to that audio interview, shall we? Let me go grab ah ah. Other Facebook shit happened. Let's listen to Alec Murdaugh's interview, shall we? Let me go grab that. Um, and then we'll go through the report. I know we're gonna be a little bit long today, but that's okay. Some days it's just that way, isn't it? And then we'll go look at the uh, work product report. Oh, I had it and then I closed it. Come on, Emily. So this is going to be an audio only. It's a 12 minute interview with Alec Murdoch. Actually, let me swoop. This is an audio only that has been released by Bland Richter. This is an interview that Alec gave more contemporaneous to the death of Gloria Satterfield as part of the insurance investigation. And then we're going to go through the attorney work product with regard to that insurance investigation. This is just never ending, right? So this is a 12 minute audio interview. I will probably pause it um, at, at times and that's what we're going to do. All right. Let me pull this up from the Bland Richter website and listen to this audio. Um, and I'll put this link down below as well, or the mods can, the mods will put the link uh, down below. Thank you, Miguelina. So that if you want to go look at this report for yourself or listen to the audio again without me chatting, you are welcome to go do so. Um, my name is Bryant McGowan. Um, I'm in Moselle, South Carolina today. How's that audio sound? Is um, Thursday, March 29th, times approximately 11.15 a.m. Um, I'm meeting with Alexander Murdoch. Um, uh, Mr. Murdoch, you understand I'm recording this statement? Yes, sir. And I'm doing so with your permission? Yes, sir. Can I have your full name, please? Richard Alexander Murdoch. And, um... Anyone else sick of this man's voice? Is it just me? 
Like I, Murda makes me tired at this point. Like I am tired of this man's bullshit. I am tired of his voice. Um, I, the things that we know that he has done are so appalling that I just can't with him. Do you go by Alexander? I go by Alec. Okay. No, I don't. My name is Alexander. My name is Dick Alexander, and I go by Alec. Because why not? For Alexander, obviously. Yes, sir. All right. And um, sure. I already asked you that. Um, What's your home address? Uh, It is 515 Holly Street. This is the old house that's been sold. Hampton, South Carolina, 29924. Is that your primary residence address? Yes, sir. Okay. How how long have you lived there? Since uh, January of 2000, so 18 years. Well, 17 years So and some. Now we know where this Alec, odd interview um, is. You and I have been meeting to talk about... Gloria Satterfield fell in 2018. This is after the fall, after she passed. So that's where we're at. Uh, an, an occurrence that happened here at... Uh, the property involving a Gloria Satterfield back on February 2nd of this year, which was a Friday. And you recall the incident I'm referring to? Yes, sir. All right. I, I wanted to ask you some questions about why don't you just go ahead and start off by filling me in as to how your day unfolded that day? I went to work that morning and I received a phone call from my wife that Gloria was injured, um, seriously injured, and, uh... So he was already at work and, um, was called about Gloria being injured. Okay, that's more interesting. Asking me if I could come home, I immediately left and headed to Moselle. Uh, it, it's about a 12 to 13 minute ride under normal circumstances. And I was, I appreciated the fact that this was a serious injury. So I would estimate that I made it in probably 10 minutes or so and upon arriving, uh, found Gloria, my wife, my son, Paul, and my employee, Ronnie Freeman on the, we call it a patio for lack of a better term landing area at the bottom of the steps gloria was uh, there uh, sitting up uh, big pool of blood a lot of blood the sitting on the side up is of her odd face to me, but and, brain injuries uh, can take time i mean shortly after I- they can take the which is one of the things that can be so devastating about them is that people skiing or whatever will hit their head and think they're fine. And then they're not because it can take time for stuff to go badly, but with pools of blood and stuff, I'm surprised, but, um, it does take time. I don't know when the 911 call was in this timing, but we know with where Moselle is that it does take time to get out there. Also, um, I saw a question I wanted to ask, doesn't insurance investigate this? This is part of the insurance investigation. And yes, it seems that he got there before the ambulance. No, she shouldn't have been sitting up at all. She should not have been. I'm going to rewind that just a little bit so we can listen again. Um, All right. Uh, Asking me if I could come home, I immediately left and headed to Moselle. Uh, It's about a 12 to 13 minute ride under normal circumstances. And I was, I appreciated the fact that this was a serious injury. You know, he put his blue lights on, right? He totally thought he was going code one and made that drive in less than 12 to 15 minutes. Right. So I would estimate that I made it in probably 10 minutes or so. Probably less. He absolutely used his lights to get there. uh, Found Gloria my wife, my son, Paul, and my employee, Ronnie Freeman, on the, we call it a patio for lack of a better term, landing area at the bottom of the steps. Gloria was uh, there uh, sitting up, uh, big pool of blood. 
it seems that Maggie called Alec before she called 911. Sorry, code three. Yeah, I don't, I don't know things. So yeah, he was definitely called before. Isn't PMPED like 20 minutes away? Heather, yes, it is. I don't doubt that Alec made it in 10 based on what we saw at the murder trial. A lot of blood on the side of her face. And uh, shortly after I arrived here, EMS arrived and tended to her. Um, did you know Gloria was coming to your house that day? I didn't. Okay. But was that I don't uncommon? believe that. Was that uncommon for Gloria to be here at your house? Uncommon for her to be here? Yeah. Was it, I mean, did you said you when you left for work that morning, you you didn't know that Gloria was going to be coming to work. I mean, coming for any purpose to the I, house. But, I didn't know that that day. Right. My my wife knew she was coming. Okay. Um, did you, and when you talked with your wife, you understood that she was coming for what reason? Gloria was coming to be paid. My mom inadvertently left town without paying Gloria for work and had asked Maggie to pay her on her behalf. And so Gloria was coming here to get paid. Okay. And were you able true. to speak with Gloria, um, before she was taken away in the ambulance? I was. Okay. Did uh, did you ask her what? I know it doesn't make any sense, chat, that she was coming there to get paid when Alec was already at work and Maggie and Paul were asleep. Who also, I hate to say it, but chat, you know what's coming. If, if Maggie is asleep and Paul is asleep and Alec is at work, why are the dogs running around the property? Literally, it's the only time that non-ironically I'm going to say, who let the dogs out? Was it their property manager who was there, but if the property manager or the, the groundskeeper is there to do work, why would you have the dogs out? Especially if the dogs are getting in the way, you wouldn't want the dogs out if you're trying to do work on the grounds. It, it doesn't make any sense. And we actually get to ask the fucking question. The question is relevant. Who actually let the dogs out? Who, who? I can't help myself what happened sure i asked her what happened i mean the first thing i was making sure that gloria tr tr i was trying to assess her mental capability at the time did she know where she was did she know what was going on that type of thing and you know asking her if she knew me did she know maggie did she know paul did she know ronnie did she know where she was so how was she responding to that? She knew questions? she knew those things. She knew where she was. She knew who I was. I mean, she she obviously was not functioning at full capacity, but she did. She, I mean, she knew those things. OK. And then the uh, ambulance removed her. And uh, did you follow the ambulance after that? I did. OK. I and followed the ambulance to um, Colleton Hospital and they were a little bit ahead of me. They lost me going through town. I was able to keep up with them. Did you put your park. lights on? But probably in town, they kept plugging away and I slowed up, you know, for the speed limits and traffic. And I'd say they I got slowed a few up for speed limits. So mm -hmm. when I arrived at the hospital, they were actually loading Gloria onto the helicopter. Okay. So now, they helicoptered um, her here at your home. I know you and I covered a lot of information regarding the dogs you've got. Yes, sir. Um, why don't you just go Them down dogs. The, the, I think you said you have four dogs. Four dogs. We okay. have Bubba, who is a yellow lab, and he's the oldest. Estimate that he's probably six years old. Leave Bubba we alone. Have, uh, Bourbon, who is a chocolate lab, who I estimate is probably a year and a half old. Uh, oh, Bourbon's maybe a puppy. younger than that. I'd say a year and a half at the oldest. We have uh, Blue, who I estimate is a year old uh, and, and excuse me blue is a lab labrador poodle mix so a labradoodle <laughs> he's and, like i don't know my um, wife picked that dog is what he sounds like sassy who is a german short hair who is which is the dog that spent the most time with maggie i thought months, it was bubba okay um and in particular i think you had expressed that um bourbon the female chocolate lab um i believe she was purchased from uh lazy lab kennels 
and we're gonna we're gonna button up all that data. Uh, but right. she had been away. The data at, on the dog. Uh, uh, obedience school. Is that correct? Whoa, 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 whoa. The dog just came back from obedience school, like sleepaway obedience school. I'm sorry. I'm a cat person. There's no obedience happening in my world. But the dog just came back from obedience school. I don't know if bourbon is tappy toes. I don't know. That is correct. And how long had she been back when this incident occurred? What? Uh, I, I, for some, I, I believe that when we back when this thing was going on, we knew. He's I think it'd been back a when day. this thing I think was going she'd on. Been back uh, a, a little more than a day. Okay. A day? She had been back a day. So the dog just comes back from obedience training, and the owners are asleep, and the dog's running around the property. Um. And when you were talking with uh, Gloria before she was taken away, did she, did she, uh, Oh no, I am. I'm trained to obey my cats in any way. They don't obey me. She was, she was out of it. She indicated that the dogs had caused her to fall. Okay. And she was at the base of the front steps. She was. Okay. Um, he answered that very naturally. She indicated the dogs caused her to fall. And in particular, I think you had expressed that, um, bourbon, the female chocolate lab, um, I believe she was purchased from uh, Lazy Lab Kennels, and we're gonna we're gonna button up all that data. Uh, but right. she had been away at a, um, a obedience school. Is that correct? That is correct. And how long had she been back when this incident occurred? Uh, I, for some, I, I believe that when we back when this thing was going on, we knew. I think it had been a day. I think she had been back. That's wild. Uh, a, a little more than a day. Okay. Um, and w when you were talking with uh, Gloria before she was taken away, did she did she uh, describe the chain of events in any way to you? Obviously, she was she was out of it. She but indicated so. that the dogs had caused her to fall. Okay. And she was at the base of the front steps. She when, was. When you arrived. My understanding was well, she was sitting on the base of the steps when I arrived. Now, my understanding from my wife, when she found her, she was unconscious. Unconscious. And uh, her head was on the landing area and her feet were up the steps. So she was like she was upside down. Well, so like I she, think she was laying on her back backwards. or on her side, but her feet were up on like the second step, yeah. and her head was on the ground. So she was literally on the steps with her head down on the brick oh, that's landing awful. area. Okay. Um, this interview is after did, she passed away. Did Gloria live here at the property? No, she did not. Okay. Do you know what her? Um, where how far away her home is i don't was. i don't know her exact address but i know that gloria lived in Furman, south carolina okay so that's um, about uh 20 minutes 20 minutes 25 minutes okay it's in hampton county and how long would you estimate that gloria had been doing work for you and or your family she's been working for our family for who close to 20 years, 20 I would estimate. years. I mean, she babysat my children when they were, when my youngest was an infant. So okay. he's She 19. helped raise your kids. Right. So. And, um, and, and she was paid, um, paid along. She was not a, like a full-time employee. She was an hourly. I mean, she would be paid by the hour when she would work. Though I think she probably should have been an employee in the home, but that's a whole separate conversation. Okay. All right, and I know I know we had, we had gone over that the obedience school is run by Brett Lawson, That's and correct. you're gonna you're gonna tie down the rest of that information for me. I'm gonna get Brett Lawson's. I'm gonna get what what paperwork he has. I'm gonna get vet records, and I'm gonna get the genealogical papers on bourbon. Okay, and uh, uh, when was the last time you would estimate that uh, Gloria had worked? Uh, for either you or your wife Maggie here at the house prior to this event. I mean, Gloria did something. I mean, she was routinely doing things for us. So whether it was w running errands, whether it was doing something at the Hampton house um, or doing something out here, it would have been 
It would have been very recent past. It would have been within 14 days. Certainly within 14 days. Okay. Pro um, probably less than that. All right. Um, and she was familiar with uh, Bubba, Blue, and Sassy. Uh, did she ever have any problems with either uh, any of those dogs? No. Okay. She was familiar with yeah. She was familiar with them, and um, I mean, she would have been familiar with Bourbon before she went off. To, of course, she would have. She worked um, at that house every I single don't day. Know if we ever had her? I'm trying to think. I don't know that we ever had Bourbon at home before. But she was certainly familiar with Bourbon. I mean, with Bubba Blue and. And sassy. sassy. Okay. It's again stunning to um, me that there's no dogs barking on the 911 call. Did she, during the course when she would be working for you, would she feed the dogs? Sure. Okay. I mean, there have been occasions where she did. Okay. Out at the kennels right. or at the house? Because the dogs normally stayed at the yeah. kennels, we learned in the murder trial. I'm trying to this think is of so anything. Sad. Did you ever have any other incidences um, involving? any um, problems with the dogs being aggressive or any any similar, I, I guess any kind yeah. of incident with uh, a we, complaint about the dogs. We've yeah. never had any issue with any of the dogs. Until Bubba solved your murder case. I mean, other than other than that issue, until Bubba was the undoing of, of the murder, other than that, no problems. Dogs being vicious or aggressive in the sense of i don't think the dogs if the dogs tripped gloria i don't think that it was the dogs being vicious i think it was a lot of big dogs around if again that's what happened a lot of big dogs around can knock people open it or open over it does happen i just don't know if that's what happened here i don't know because the whole i just because the whole thing's so weird of um of violence or biting or attacking or any of that and and the, the problem is and why we sent that's fair bourbon to obedience school is as i told you earlier she would i mean she's so hyper she would stir all the dogs get stirred up and they compete for the to be petted and to be uh, to get attention and it's, so you know what i'm assuming happened is when gloria pulled up the dogs are you know rushing her you for know, affection for affection and, <laughs> but and why you know, were the dogs out but affection and, and, and you know bourbon had only been back for a day or so so you know it, it, that, that the way they all do when bourbon's here is different than they do when it's just them okay so uh, the people that were that were on on site when the ambulance came were were, were you, your wife Maggie, your son um, Paul, Paul, and an employee of yours, Ronnie Freeman. That's correct. And was anybody with um, uh, Gloria. Gloria when she drove up? I assume she drove her own car here. That's correct. And was there anybody in the car with her? No, sir. Okay. So there was no witness to. To for the falling chain of events. to the fall itself right no sir okay. not that i'm aware of okay and do you have any surveillance cameras around the exterior of the home no sir okay and you know what uh, after I this happened he still doesn't put in surveillance cameras isn't that odd to you that's odd to me after an incident like this on the house they still don't put in surveillance cameras after he said Paul was being threatened by people on the internet, and we know that this happens because the internet's going to internet and it's the worst, he still doesn't put up cameras out at Moselle. Why? I have tried to go over everything I can think of. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. All right, with nothing else to add, I'll be concluding the interview at this time. And again, I'd like to ask if you understood I recorded it. All sure. right, that's the end of the interview. Molly said, why is Alec outing himself now in these legal filings? Alec, Alec has nothing left to lose at this point. So I think some of this might be scorched earth. And he's like, no, I lied about that with the dogs. But what Bland Richter are saying is, no, there's other information here. And they're not the only ones that said, or Alec's not the only one that said that the dogs tripped Gloria. And again, it could happen. This could be a tragic accident that Alec then exploited to his own financial benefit. Like, well, 
you know, somebody, somebody tripped and died on my property. And instead of saying it's an accident, if I say it's my fault, I can go after the insurance funds, the dogs, you know, we knew the dogs were, um, a little unruly. That makes it our fault. We should have had them locked up. If people were coming to the property different than if someone trips for other reasons or just trips because people fall on stairs, um, it does happen. So it's, I think Alec decided to exploit the situation or that's really what happened. I don't know. Why is he lying about it now and saying, no, that's not what happened. I don't know. I don't know. Um, probably I, I hate to think it's just to go scorched earth on the Satterfield boys because Tony testified against him at the murder trial. I would hate to think that that's the reason and that his attorneys would abide by that. But now he's saying, Oh, even after he confessed to judgment, and I covered that on Thursday, even after he confessed to judgment saying we're at fault with this, um, he's now still turning around and saying he lied. Eric Bland makes good points. Why didn't he say he lied before he confessed to judgment? I don't know. So now we have a 12 page comprehensive report, the types of which we normally never get to see because it is confidential attorney work product. This was provided to the public by Bland Richter. I don't know how that'll go, if anybody will say anything, or if it was agreed to be released. We'll see. This is their second comprehensive report from the attorneys that were investigating the death of Gloria Satterfield with relation to the insurance claim. I should swoop. Swoop! And then we'll go to questions. Investigation of this claim is ongoing. I recently obtained medical treatment records for decedent Gloria Satterfield. And I, again, this is a first look for me. Um, hopefully a first look for you too. Depending upon whether time permits and whether the claim does not resolve, it would be useful to have an expedited record review performed by a physician with expertise in emergency medicine and or internal medicine to evaluate whether Ms. Satterfield's health on the incident date played a role in her fall down the stairs. Could this have been a medical could this have been medically related, um, not dog related? Because again, the insurance company, I would imagine, is looking for a way for this not to be the insured's fault. If this is a bad knee or she was unstable on her feet or recently had um, incidences of lightheadedness or I think on 911 they asked if she could have had a stroke and things like that. If they find there's another reason that she fell, the insurance company doesn't have to play out, pay out. So it's my speculation, I've never worked in insurance, but it's my speculation that insurance is looking for all angles to explain, yes, now that we've covered all of our bases, we have to pay out this claim or no, we don't have to pay out. It's covered by workman's comp. There's no liability here. This is just an accident, what have you. So they're looking for all angles to not pay this claim, I imagine. I have not yet placed the dog trainer on notice of potential contribution claim by Murdaugh. Mr. Murdaugh considers that in uh, improvident. I therefore want to discuss that with you further. I've, I don't think I've ever seen that word spelled out. Claimant council has made a policy limits settlement offer with an acceptable deadline of November 12th or an acceptance deadline of November 12th. We need to decide how to respond to that demand and whether to seek, um, enlargement of his imposed deadline. <laughs> it's an odd way to say it an enlargement of the deadline. I've only, I've only seen extension of the deadline. Am I not using the word enlargement properly chat? Do I need to start enlarging deadlines when I'm going to miss them? Can we enlarge the time that I start my own stream by about 15 minutes? It's an odd way to use that word. I'm trying not to be picky. I'm just, my brain got stuck. Uh, executive summary. Decedent Gloria Satterfield worked as a contract housekeeper and domestic assistant in the insured Mr. Murdaugh, uh, assistant to the insured Mr. Murdaugh and his family. Murdaugh is a successful personal injury attorney in Hampton, South Carolina, and owns a second home. I'm going to be in South Carolina later this month. And owns a second home on rural property in the neighboring Colton County. On the morning of February 2nd, 2018, Satterfield drove alone to the Colton residence to Moselle to see Miss Murdaugh and pick up a check in payment for the Satterfield's for Satterfield's past services. Though Maggie was asleep, Satterfield walked up to the front brick steps of the house and allegedly fell backward down the steps due to being pushed or tripped by one or more of the Murdaugh's four pet dogs, which were roaming free at the time. No one witnessed Satterfield's fall. 
Miss Murdaugh was inside the house, heard a great commotion on the front porch, came out the front door and found Satterfield lying on the steps, bleeding from an open wound in her head. Satterfield told Miss Murdaugh, who Mr. Murdaugh, who arrived soon after, that the dogs had, quote, tripped her up. Satterfield made no other statement to a witness about involvement of dogs. Satterfield told medical staff at the hospital later that she did not know how or why she fell. Satterfield was airlifted to a hospital in Charleston where she was admitted for treatment of multiple rib fractures, a pulmonary contusion, and a subdural hematoma. She had surgery for the rib fractures. The subdural hematoma was inoperable. Satterfield's initial, Satterfield initially showed improvement and then began to decline and was placed on a ventilator. She contracted pneumonia, had a heart attack and lost pulse, was revived but left in a deep coma. Her family elected to stop life-saving measures. She was moved to hospice and died on February 26, 2018. After all of that, he stole from her kids. I can't get past it. I can't fucking get past it. I cannot. I cannot. Satterfield incurred medical treatment charges in excess of $650,000. She is survived by two adult sons, one of whom is mentally disabled. Her estate and both sons are represented by counsel, and he let them lose their home by not paying them the settlement that he stole. So this case tells me everything I need to know about who Alec Murdaugh as a human is. The murder case aside. So there's some that are like, with the murder case, I don't see how this person could kill his wife and kid. I don't see the motive. I don't understand this case. I don't always understand the murder case either. But this case tells you exactly who Alec Murdaugh is. Because most people wouldn't be capable of this So her estate and both sons are represented by counsel who is advised of his intent to bring a lawsuit against Mr. Murdaugh, which they did. The law uh, applicable to this matter provides that the owner of a pet dog is strictly liable where the dog jumps on visiting guests and causes injury. Liability is probable. So this is the insurance company saying, if the dogs did this, then liability for us is probable. We should settle before we go to trial where people are going to be like, no. And then you could lose more than policy limits. Relevant background facts. The insured Alec Murdaugh is a third generation lawyer practicing with his family's law firm in Hampton, South Carolina, before he burned that to the ground, figuratively. The firm Peters, Murdaugh, Parker, Elstroth, and Diedrich, Dietrich, is a preeminent plaintiff-only practice. The firm and its partners have favorable reputation in the area of the state due to the firm's expertise and influence and goodwill created in the community. The firm also has an office in Colton. Mr. Murdoch's primary residence is in Hampton. Murdoch and his wife own a second residence nearby Moselle, which is in a rural part of Colton County. The residence is typically used by them on weekends and holidays, includes several hundred acres of land, much of its swamp used for hunting. Uh, there's Moselle. At the time of the incident, February 2018, Mr. and Mrs. Murdaugh were staying at the Moselle residence most of the time. Gloria Satterfield worked for 20 years as a housekeeper and personal assistant to Mr. Murdaugh's mother and Mr. Murdaugh and his wife, Maggie. There was no written employment agreement and Satterfield could be considered an at-will independent contractor of Mr. and Mrs. Murdaugh, paid at the rate of $10 an hour. Satterfield was not considered a full-time employee of the Murdaughs and no taxes were deducted from her paycheck. Satterfield would do household chores, babysitting of their children, run errands, and act as a server at parties hosted by the Murdaughs. So basically everything. Satterfield spent considerable time with the Murdaugh family and, as, in, as is common in South Carolina, was considered, quote, part of the family in a loose sense. Satterfield was not... Act, Satterfield has no actual kinship to the Murdaughs. However, I appreciate that they have to... Uh, have to clarify that. Satterfield had no other employment and they paid her $10 an hour? Okay. Mr. Murdoch considered Satterfield to be very trustworthy and dependable. Satterfield did not wear glasses or contacts, but did use quote unquote reading glasses for reading. I mean, same, I'm in the middle of like seven different prescriptions, like the ones I use for streaming so I can read the screen, the ones I need to play a book or my Nintendo Switch, the ones I need for driving, all the glasses. 
Satterfield was widowed and lived in Furman, South Carolina, also in Hampton County with her adult son, Brian, who has mild. I don't I don't like that. They that they that's what they went to, who has um, mental incapacity and is not self-reliant. Satterfield's other son, Tony, is a registered nurse in Beaufort, South Carolina. Tony is the personal representative of her estate. Until Murdoch swapped him out and used somebody else to steal this settlement. The Murdoch's own four pet dogs, several of which have been to obedience training and have been trained for hunting and sporting activities. Bubba is a six-year-old yellow male lab. Bourbon is a 1.5-year-old female chocolate lab. Blue is a one-year-old male labradoodle. And is Bubba's son. Wait, Bubba has babies? We, this is new information. It is a very antiquated term. A very antiquated term. Which is why we just, we skipped over things. Bubba has a kid. How did we not know that Bubba is a dad? Blue. Blue is a one-year-old lab, male labradoodle and Bubba's son. I'm just, I'm focusing in on the genealogy of the dogs. <laughs> because I'm delighted by it. Okay, Bubba, Blue is a one-year-old male labradoodle. Bubba's son described as hyperactive and constantly escaping from his kennel. That's how they described Bubba too. Wait, look at how they describe Bubba here. Hold on. Bubba is a six-year-old male yellow Labrador retreater, not neutered, and described as affectionate and calm. Is that how we saw Bubba described? Did we see Bubba described as affectionate and calm during this murder trial? That's not what they said about Bubba at all. He has been to hunting and obedience training and is obedient. He weighs around 90 pounds. Veterinary records indicate rec uh, receipt of annual shots and annual exams. I'm sorry. They said that Bubba was hard headed, that he was aggressive, that he would always escape from everything and was all running around all willy nilly. And his son Blue is likewise hyperactive and hard headed. Blue is also difficult to command and control. He weighs around 65 pounds. Sassy is a six month old female German short haired pointer puppy. She was acquired in January and has not had training. She weighs about 25 pounds and has a calm disposition. These Murdoch dogs, man, are just getting everything blamed on them. Mr. Murdoch described that normally bourbon and blue would be kept in the dog kennels at the property and did not roam free, begging the question, who let the dogs out on this day in the morning when nobody was awake? The property has an electric underground dog fence system to keep the dogs close to the house. Murdoch described that whenever all of the dogs were out of the kennel and in the presence of any people, the dogs would approach the people in a friendly, normal, and sociable way. They tended to compete with each other for affection or attention of people. He described that if someone showed praise or attention to one dog, the other dogs would get jealous and escalate efforts to gain the person's attention. I mean, I have cats. <laughs> That's what they do. George more so than Fred. Sometimes if you're if you're giving attention to George, Fred will stare at you, turn his back and walk away. But if you are giving attention to Fred, George will come up and get in your face and be like, yo, I exist. Bourbon was sent to Brett Lawson, a dog trainer in Jasper County for obedience and hunting training. The goal of training was to calm the dog down. Murdoch felt training was helpful. While dates are unclear, Bourbon was picked up from obedience training a day or just a few days before the subject incident, which doesn't make sense either. Below is a photo of Bourbon. Hi, Bourbon. Leave Bourbon alone. It, if Bourbon had just come back from training, is Bourbon really knocking somebody down the stairs? I have so many questions. It's a little smaller um, so you guys can see it. Oop. There we go. On the incident date, Mr. Murdoch left from the Moselle house to go to work around 8 a.m., his son, Paul, age 19, was inside the house. His wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul, were inside the house. A property caretaker, Ronnie, was at the property but not in view of the house. Satterfield drove to the house to pick up a paycheck, parked, and apparently walked up the front steps. Below are two photographs of the subject's stairs. So this is the kind of entryway that he was calling a landing, and this is up the stairs. This looks like Murda in a blue shirt in 2018 and Bubba with something in his mouth walking up the stairs. I've interviewed Alec Murdaugh, Maggie Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh. Let's take a look at these interviews. Exactly. Who was going to give her the check? Jamie, you're, yes. Who was going to give, who was going to give Gloria Satterfield her check 
if everybody's asleep and was woken up by the dogs? I have so many questions. Alec left the house that morning around 745 to go to his office in Hampton. He had been at work about two hours and got a call from his wife, Maggie, who said that Satterfield was injured at the house. Alec drove back to the house, arrived before EMS did. He found Satterfield sitting on the brick landing at the base of the steps. She was semi-conscious, um, knew who she was, and had blood on her head and face. There was a pool of blood on the brick landing. Satterfield indicated something about the dogs tripping her up. EMS arrived and took over. EMS debated whether to have a helicopter land in the community somewhere to trans. Port Satterfield to the Medical Trauma Center. EMS decided to drive Satterfield to Colton Medical Center in Walterboro, South Carolina, about 30 minutes away to put her on a helicopter there. Why didn't they just helicopter her from Moselle? It has a fucking airstrip. I don't know. The, that's my question. Just bring that. Maybe they couldn't. Maybe there were reasons why they couldn't. But just why not just bring the helicopter to Moselle? Just questions. Um <clears throat> All the cases that I had that involved somebody being airlifted, and I practiced in a very large community um, in Los Angeles where there's lots of level one trauma centers, but all of the airlift cases that I dealt with were all related to head trauma. I don't, that might just be a coincidence, but they were all head trauma cases. Uh, let's see. Alec followed the ambulance to Walterboro. He was giving, uh, he was given Satterfield's purse just before she was put on the helicopter he drove back to his house in Moselle. He attempted to call and text Satterfield's brother, but did not speak with him. Alec told me that he had heard from one or more of the Satterfield's relatives. He cannot really recall that Satterfield had reported that the dogs tripped her up. Alec never visited Satterfield in the hospital. Alec attended Satterfield's funeral. And at her funeral, approached her sons and said, I'll just basically sue myself for the insurance money and get this all taken care of you. Um, so there's that Christine D in the chat. Thank you for that. Said there are strict protocols for helicopter life flights and she probably was too stable to qualify, but they did helicopter her. They drove her by ambulance 30 minutes and then airlifted her from the hospital. Maybe, maybe protocols prevented them just landing at Moselle. Just the things that go through my head. Like if I was Working on this case, I would have a running list of questions that I would want to tick off answers to because I would want to know. So I would, you're just getting to hear that process out loud <laughs> of me going, well, what about this? And what about this? And why didn't they do that? Because I'd want to know. Maggie Murdoch, let's see what Maggie had to say. I interviewed Maggie by telephone two weeks ago. Maggie described that the morning of the incident, she was in bed asleep. Her son, Paul, was asleep in his bedroom. Again, then why are the dogs out? Um, her son, Paul, was asleep in the bedroom. Maggie expected Satterfield to arrive at the house at some point that day. The four dogs were outside the house and were seldom let inside the house. The chocolate lab bourbon had just been picked up from dog training. The two employees, Ronnie uh, Freeman and Travis Martin, were on the property working but were not near the house. Maggie heard the dogs barking in an unusual tone as if something had happened. She went out the front door and found Satterfield lying on her back, head towards the bottom of the steps with a bleeding head wound. Satterfield was not carrying any objects. Satterfield's eyes were open and she was conscious, but mumbling, quote, gibberish. Satterfield did uh, not, Satterfield did not what happened. I'm imagining saying no what happened. Maggie shouted, oh my God. The four dogs were walking near Satterfield. Maggie's son, Paul, came outside. Ronnie Friedman and Travis came up to the house. Maggie called 911 and sent Travis, and tr sent Travis was sent to the highway to direct EMS when they arrived. No one rendered first aid before EMS arrived. Maggie put all the dogs inside the house. Okay, well, that makes sense. At least that's answered. Um, the dogs were in the house maybe before she called 911? I don't know. Alec Murdaugh arrives before EMS. Calton County EMS, an ambulance and fire truck, arrive and took over care. Satterfield told them her name and said the current president is, quote, unquote, Bill Clinton. Maggie tried to call Satterfield's son, Tony and Satterfield's sister, Ginger. Tony called back and was told Satterfield was injured and being taken to the hospital. EMS initially planned to drive Satterfield to a recreational field a few miles away for a helicopter to land and transport her to Charleston. They decided not to do that, and instead EMS drove Satterfield to Colton Regional Medical Center um, about 30 miles away and meet the helicopter there. Maggie and Alec drove separate vehicles. Maggie drove straight to Trident Hospital in North Charleston, where Satterfield arrived and was admitted. Maggie met Satterfield's relatives, Tony, Sandra, and Ginger at the hospital. 
Maggie saw Satterfield in the ICU. She was sleeping, but occasionally woke and stated her head hurt and that she was cold. Maggie said she never visited Satterfield alone. Maggie recalled that at the time of Satterfield's admission, it was the peak of flu season and the patients were on gurneys in every hallway. Satterfield never told Maggie why Satterfield fell. Maggie said that Satterfield's relatives told Maggie that, quote, the dogs tripped Gloria up. Maggie said she visited Satterfield about five or six times and that Satterfield was always two steps forward, but one step back in her recovery. Eventually, and that's not what we had, were not what had been reported previously, was that none of them had visited her in the hospital. So that's uh, that's different than what we've heard before. Eventually, Maggie knew that Satterfield was declining and nearing death, and Maggie was not surprised by that. When Satterfield did, the family called Maggie to let her know. I think that means past or did, in fact, die. The family never discussed any legal issues or made accusations to Maggie or Alec. Maggie said that the chocolate lab bourbon was, quote unquote, just horrible, always whining, seeking attention and getting excited. I thought Maggie loved the dogs and nothing more than the dogs. Maggie said it was not uncommon for the four dogs who were friendly to visitors to get under people's feet whenever they came to the house. I mean, at 75, 80 pounds, they're getting under people's knees. Um, Maggie said that Satterfield knew the four dogs and had never experienced any problems with them, which is also confusing. Maggie said that Satterfield had no perceived health problems that made her unsteady when standing or walking. I asked Maggie what she thinks happened, and she believes that one or more of the dogs um, got in Satterfield's way and Satter as Satterfield was coming up the stairs. Did they jump on her at the top of the stairs and knock her backwards? I don't know. All right, Paul, the son of Alex and Maggie, was interviewed telephonically two weeks ago. His date of birth is April 14th, 1999. He lives with his parents and is in college, enrolled at the University of South Carolina. Uh, I'm not even going to try with which campus he's at in Allendale, South Carolina. At the time of the fall incident, Paul was asleep in his downstairs bedroom. He heard the dogs barking, which was typical when someone was coming up the driveway. He heard his mother call him and knew something was wrong. He went out the front porch and saw Satterfield had fallen off the front steps. Maggie was rushing to get a telephone. Satterfield's feet were on the second or third step from the bottom, and she was laying on her back. She was bleeding from a head wound, and blood was on the brick landing area. She was awake, making weird noises, but not making any sense. Paul did not try to talk with her, remembers that his father, Alec, arrived and asked what happened, and Satterfield said, quote, said something about the dogs. I'm not clear if Paul heard that. The way this is written, I'm not clear if Paul heard that from Gloria when she said it, or if Paul heard that from Alec. Is that more clear to you? Am I over, am I reading into it too much? Paul did not try to talk with her, remembers that his father arrived and asked what happened and that Satterfield, quote, said something about the dogs. Maybe he heard it. We're never going to know. Satterfield started throwing up. Oh, that's not good. And so Alec and Paul sat her up while they waited for EMS to arrive. They should have rolled her on her side, but okay. EMS arrived and asked Satterfield her name, which Satterfield was able to give. Paul had not spoken with Satterfield's relatives about the incident. He did not attend the funeral. Social media was harvested for Mr. for Miss Satterfield's son, Tony, who is a nurse in Beaufort. Tony Satterfield's Facebook page is largely public with several posts on updates of Miss Satterfield from the time of the subject incident to her death. On February 2nd, Tony reported in a Facebook post that Miss Satterfield fell and hit her head, resulting in a hematoma. She was flown to Trident Medical and treated for the hematoma and broken ribs. At the time, he reported that Miss Satterfield was responding. I mean, He's a good person to relay the information because he actually understands what is going on. This is his field. Over the next week, he reported on Satterfield's condition and that the hematoma was going down. Ms. Satterfield had surgery to place a plate near her ribs for stabilization February 5th. On February 10th, she was placed on a BiPAP machine due to low oxygen levels. On February 11th, she was transferred back to the ICU. She was observed for the next week and reported that she was attempting to speak. Her vitals remained on the edge. That must have been heartbreaking for this family. The doctors were continuing monitoring for whether Miss Satterfield needed to be placed on life support to maintain her vitals. On February 18th, Tony reported that PT came and met with Satterfield and she attempted to sit on the side of the bed. She was to undergo a swallow test on February 19th. 
on the 20th, um, her heart stopped and she received CPR and was placed on a ventilator. On February 22nd, he reported that she was still on the ventilator, um, but with no gag reflex, but reported good labs and continued monitoring. He noted that she had opened her eyes on a few occasions, but it was unknown if it was due to brain activity. On February 25th, he reported that the MRI and EEG were performed, showing a great amount of blood in the brain, causing her brain to shift back and forth. He reported in a second post on the 25th that she had passed. Absolutely heartbreaking. Based on an ISO report, Satterfield was in a motor vehicle accident of some sort on February 1st, 2018, the day before the incident. According to the report, Satterfield's vehicle struck a parked car. We do not have details about that incident yet. Mr. Murdoch was not aware of it until I mentioned it. He believes that would have been a low impact accident, else Ms. Satterfield would have mentioned it to him and would have called him for legal guidance. I mean, that's that seems logical. Satterfield is survived by two adult sons. Um, let's see. We received some of Satterfield's medical records from claimant counsel on October 29th. Counsel basically provided the care flight records and Trident hospital records. We've already heard the rundown from Tony Satterfield. So if there's more, I'm not going to get into that. I have completed an initial review of the care flight and Trident hospital records. Satterfield had a significant history of chronic kidney disease and high blood sugar. Whether that contributed to her fall, I cannot tell. There is no reference in any medical record to how or why Satterfield said only that she fell from standing height down a few stairs. There's no reference to dogs causing her fall. The admitting emergency doctor's note stated she does not know why she fell, which is interesting because did the dogs, did the dogs cause the fall? Did the dogs not call the, cause the fall? Was this all insurance fraud? I don't know. In the fall, she sustained a right side head laceration and right sided subdural hematoma and traumatic brain injury. We've gone through that. Um, so let's see at Trident hospital. She had surgery. We went through that and then leading the cause of her death. Okay. Corey Fleming, we're on page 10 of 12. Hang with me, Chad. How we doing? Mods, how we doing? Good. We'll be there. We'll be there. Um, yes for, and I will again list, put the, where this is, if any of you want to read through the report for yourselves and the parts I've skipped over, if you want to look at the medical information a little more. Attorney Corey Fleming, who is a partner with Moss, Kuhn, and Fleming uh, Law Firm in Beaufort, well, was, has been retained by claimants. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about that. Fleming is very capable attorney and focuses his practice. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about that. On personal injury and criminal defense. I recently settled a less serious slip and fall case with Mr. Fleming before he was disbarred. Alec Murdaugh worked at Mr. Fleming's law firm a few years after law school, 20 years ago, before Murdaugh joined his current firm in Hampton. Yep, and he told the Satterfields to hire Corey Fleming and left out that he and Corey Fleming were BFFs. Mr. Murdaugh does not want to be sued over this matter if practical and possible to avoid that as he sees that a wrongful death lawsuit would be detrimental to him personally and professionally in that small rural community. What about a murder prosecution? How does he feel about that? Um, venue of any filed lawsuit is a key issue. If the suit were to be filed, it may be filed in Calton County where the incident and the Satterfield injury occurred, or Hampton County, where the Murdaws reside. Uh, it's highly likely we could get a suit venue transferred from Colton County to Hampton. Both of these counties sit within the 14th Judicial Circuit. The 14th Circuit is known to be plaintiff-friendly. So this is an inside peek that we never get. Remember, this is labeled work product. This is an inside peek into how the insurance is is evaluating this and they have to evaluate this. If this goes to trial and the jury hates what happened here, how much money is the jury going to give this family and what are our policy limits? So this is the maths that they are going through to figure out if the math is mathing or not. Hampton County is among the most pro plaintiff trial venues in South Carolina. I wonder what Murdaugh had to do with that. Largely because of the, <laughs> keep fucking reading, Emily. <laughs> Largely because of the influence of Mr. Murdaugh's law firm in pursuing cases there. Calton County is not considered quite as plaintiff friendly as Hampton County. 
Given Mr. Murdaugh's involvement as a party, not an attorney for a party, I tend to think Mr. Murdaugh would be very favorably viewed by a jury at the time. Absent a case being designated complex, cases are not assigned to particular judges in South Carolina. The 14th Circuit has two residing judges, Judge Buckner and Judge Mullen. These judges know Mr. Murdaugh and Mr. Fleming well. I think that's an understatement because Judge Mullen is the one who signed off on this settlement without even asking about the Satterfield boys. Excuse me. Reserves and budgeting. As articulated in past reports, we're still recommending setting loss reserves at policy limits. It is our understanding that stated coverage amount for the Murdaugh's homeowner's policy is $500,000, subject to any reservations or exclusions. As to defense expenses, the estimate cost to finish the investigation, evaluate the claim, um, is approximately $25,000. The estimated cost to finish the investigation, evaluate the claim, pre-suit negotiations, will be approximately $125,000. To date, build fees are over $9,000. Expenses, $300,000. Current evaluation. This is fascinating. We never get to see shit like this ever. Current evaluation. The claim investigation is not entirely complete. While there were no eyewitnesses to Satterfield's actual fault, the Murdoch home circumstantial, I said that weird, circumstantial evidence available together with Satterfield's post incident statement to Murdoch and her relatives, if true suggest the insured's dog or dogs were loose and near Satterfield and could have caused Satterfield to trip and fall down the steps and sustain her head and bodily injuries, which were the cause of her later death. I would characterize liability based on what is known at this point as probable, but not clear and convincing. I think a medical review to verify Satterfield did not fall from a medical symptom would be useful. The damages expected to be claimed are extensive. So this is, again, the insurance company trying to evaluate what they would lose by going to trial. As to a survival claim, the damages uh, to be claimed would include almost $700,000 of medical treatment. Satterfield's significant pain and suffering at the accident scene and in the hospital for several weeks. Right, because Satterfield did not die instantly. So they would put evaluation on the pain and suffering from however long from the point of the fall to the ambulance getting there. And then for the weeks that Satterfield was alive in the hospital, which means this claim could actually be more uh, or cost insurance more than had she died instantly. Claim damages for the survival claim are thus estimated perhaps a million as to the wrongful death claim. Those damages would be claimed to include Tony's grief and loss in association with his mother for over 20 years, perhaps valued a total of a million Brian Satterfield's grief and loss of association with his mother, also loss of partial financial support from her while he is disabled, perhaps valued at 1.3 million. Total damages claim could thus be 3.3 million. Again, there is no comparative fault defense to a strict liability statutory cause of action. Previously, I indicate I did not believe the claimants would make settlement demand to Brit for 500,000 policy limits coverage uh, to fully release the Murnaz. However, there appear... That appears to be their proposal, which I need to confirm this week. I'm glad to discuss. And that is the end. We now know from Eric Bland that Alec Murdoch got over $3 million from this insurance company. So when they're, when they're, um, when they're looking at that, that looks about what they settled it for. But that money went to Corey Fleming and then Corey Fleming transferred it to fake fucking forge. And then, well, Alec took it. Now the Satterfields have gotten over 7.5 million from everybody who did them wrong in this, including Bank of America, Palmetto State Bank, Corey Fleming, Corey Fleming's law firm and others, but also have a confession of judgment for 4.5 million, which we hear that Eric Bland is now like, oh, time to start enforcing that judgment and going after the money which makes sense to me. And with all of that, this is not even near done. We wouldn't really even be covering this insurance case if Alec Murdaugh hadn't said, oh, I lied about the dog things. Um, I defrauded my insurance company. And oh, by the way, bring Bland Richter and the, the Satterfield boys into this. And then I went, the fuck you did what? What's interesting is that on Thursday when I covered it, all the headlines I see were that Alec was um, lying about the dogs, but then 
we started actually seeing coverage about the fact that he was trying to bring Bland Richter into it. So now it's interesting to see that there's been lots of coverage on it. If you follow Eric Bland on Twitter, you will see it over there. It's just appalling on top of appalling, right? This case is nowhere near done. There are still over a hundred outstanding charges against Alec Murdoch. There might be more for these frauds. Maybe not. I don't know if it will get the South Carolina um, attorney general's office anywhere to go after them for this, but this civil case I will be following. I'm very interested in it. Let me know if you're interested in it. And with that, I'm going to put on some more lip gloss and we're going to get to questions. It's time to fact around and find out. Oh yeah. I think all of my segments on Alec Murdoch need to just be titled the audacity. Like, what in the fuck? It's absolutely, absolutely wild to me. All of you that like the side part on the hair, thank you. I like the side part too. It is my favorite. We need more lip gloss. It is, it is time to fuck around and find out. Am I going out tonight? No. <laughs> this is how I look for streaming and I have to record, um, I have to record some more stuff today. But no, I am not. I am, I am tired. <laughs> I want to play Zelda. I want to get ready for Tears of the Kingdom to come out. I have forgotten my game mechanics and I want to get back uh, well to sleep. I'm tired. I was up late recording the podcast last night and I have some work to do. I want to get caught up this week so I'm not tired on Thursday when I stream. All right, let's see. I think we're going with lo-fi today. Let me turn our, our volume down a little bit so it's not too distracting. I think lo-fi is what we're going with. Maybe feeding the ducks. Let's see. Let's see how we like our stream yard music today. I think this is the one I like the best. It's kind of lo-fi e. Did I turn it down too much? Maybe. No. Nope. I like the chill. I like our chill vibes. I like our chill vibes. <laughs> I see a lot of you have been playing Breath of the Wild. I've got to get ready. Like my game, my game mechanics suck right now. I'm so, I'm so bad um, at it. I turned it down too low. I did. What is the color of your lip gloss? I will be telling you soon. <laughs> I can't tell you yet. Um, Jay Lewis said, yes, cover AI. I will I will be covering AI legal cases. I'm glad you guys are interested too. I'm fascinated. It feels like we live in some kind of brave new world, right? Where we're still trying to take the laws that we've had for hundreds of years and figure out how they apply to all these new things. It's a very interesting question to me. And I'm going to keep looking at it. I'm glad it's interesting to you too. We're going to keep covering AI and crypto and influencer marketing and, of course, celebrity lawsuits because I love them. Um, Justice for Fred. He allegedly did those actions. Fred totally did it. No one else is fucking around with my camera but Fred. George wouldn't even think of it. We may, um, Music to My Soul said we may visit other places, but Murdaugh is truly our Hotel California. It really is. Um, we can check in, but we can never leave. Also, I'm drinking a Starbucks caramel macchiato. That sounds amazing. I tried, um, cause one of our lovely law nerds in the chat was like, M, here's the thing. Hear me out. Cold brew chai latte or the chai syrup for sweetener, vanilla cold foam, 1010 can recommend. It's delicious. It's delicious. It's delicious. Um, when you sang my birthday turned to the TV and smiled, my baby turned the TV and smiled. Jolly Roger, I'm so glad I amused your wee one. <laughs> I'm here for it. And I'm not a good singer, so I love that. Uh, Jen, it's good to see you. Um, I'm yes to Brittany Dawn. I will, I'm going to make a note of the hearing on June 2nd and circle back when we get that um, full breakdown of exactly what the terms of Brittany Dawn's settlement are, or at least some of them. Hempland, Texas, happy belated birthday. Thank you. Today is my first wedding anniversary since my husband passed away. Hempland, I'm so sorry, and I'm glad you're with us. And hopefully the memory of your anniversary today is a pleasant one, even though it must be bittersweet. Didn't think it would hit me this hard. So happy you were alive today to take my mind somewhere else. Yeah, be ragey at Alec Murdoch. Sometimes I find rage helps override other emotions, but just let yourself have the feels and give yourself lots of grace. Of course, it's going to be a hard day and make sure that you take care of you. Molly said, I ordered from the Lawnard shop and had an issue with my order and your team's customer service was so awesome. Thank you. Just wanted to send a compliment and thank you for being amazing. 
You're welcome. Sometimes it happens. We know issues are going to happen with volume and we always want to get them taken care of. So the compliment will be passed along. Grats to all the grads and those matriculating. Cheers, Poison Elf. I agree. The Look, the purple Stanley, this is the new soft touch one that I ordered because I was on stream and I have no chill. It, it has the little Stanley Griffin in here instead of saying Stanley. It's such a nice little update that I love. But the, the soft touch is very tactile. I mean, I'm just, I'm obsessed. But these don't fit in my cup holders very well in my car. So I've been using the Yeti in the car and the, and the Stanley's on my desk. And my children are like, oh, you're so fucking extra. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> Have you met me? Um, Brittany said, Lawner, cheers to finally getting an ADHD diagnosis. Cheers. Thank you, Ian and Rob, so much for helping me see the symptoms in myself and finally getting help. You are welcome. That's one of the most powerful things I think about talking about what we're going through is you never know. I've told this story, um, a, a number of times and I will tell it again. I was dealing with a whole bunch of health things. I mean, I had a whole we're not going to bore you with all of them, but I was dealing with a bunch of health things and I was telling one of my coworkers and he's like, look, when I first got diagnosed with a number of the food allergies I was struggling with, this is exactly what I was feeling. He's like, so if you're open to it, I would love to maybe give you the name of my allergist and maybe that's one of the pieces going on here. And I was like, I had never even considered it. My family had never really talked about food allergies. I always just had tummy stuff. So did my mother. It was just like, oh no, it's just us. And it's like, maybe it's not like just a quirk we have to deal with. Maybe we don't just have to fucking suffer and it's actually a problem. And he told the story of how he didn't realize he was allergic to chocolate until he was talking to somebody else about eating chocolate, like in college, and was talking about the fact that when he ate chocolate, it burned, like burned his mouth and burned his throat. And he's like, I never understood why people liked chocolate. I just assumed that that feeling they liked, they liked the like, and Ian Runkle can probably 10, 10 confirm. Yes, the burn is what I'm living for. But he would get that allergic mouth reaction. I get that to pineapple um, where my entire mouth and throat are like on fire. And so he was talking about how it burned. And he's like, I thought people liked that. I thought that that was the uh, sensation other people had when they ate chocolate and they just like, they just dug it because maybe they just dug it until he was explaining to people, um, doesn't, doesn't this happen to you? And people are like, are you allergic to chocolate? He's like, wait, am I allergic to chocolate? And then found out he was allergic to a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I was at work one day when he had a horrible allergic reaction to eating cashews because the cashews were cooked in peanut oil. And he was like, who he's like what monster cooks a nut in the oil of another nut and then um ems came but with all of that he was like i didn't know until i started talking to somebody and somebody was like that's not that's not how i feel maybe you're allergic to it and he was like oh maybe and then found out he had a number of pretty severe true food allergies and had survived until that point without dealing with them and so I really feel that experience changed things for me because I was like, oh, maybe this is one of the things I'm dealing with. And I was able to start to piece things together um, with my own stuff by having that conversation. And I realized how powerful that was. And it's one of the reasons I'm so open talking about my own stuff that's going on, because maybe some of you will be like, oh, wait, that's a thing. That's me, too. And that's how I felt when when Warren, uh, my friend Octo, and I were talking about time blindness. I had never heard the phrase before. And I was like, wait, say that again. There's a name for it. It's not just me having some deep moral failing that time is a fucking construct that I can't adhere to. It's a thing. And somehow being able to name it and understand it for me makes it a bit, a bit easier to deal with. Um, Annie G said liking spicy food and having allergies is a problem, I imagine. So I didn't know. Um, and, and if we don't talk about it, we don't know. And so now I ask my kids all kinds of things like, what about, how do you feel when you eat this? What do you feel about this? What about this and this and that? So I need to go back and get retested for my allergies. 
Um, does pineapple give anyone else cankers? Um, I'm sure a lot of people. Pineapple makes my freaking mouth burn and like swell. I can't eat pineapple at all. Like any kind of pineapple. Um, Emily Outdoors says, as a survivor of an abusive relationship whose family helped him perpetrate the abuse, I'm sorry. I have had a family password with my son since he was five. It changes. And we've since talked about AI scams. I'm sorry that that's experience, your experience, Emily. It's awful. I'm so glad that your vigilance is going to pay off with your kiddo. And even though I know sometimes that vigilance can be a trauma response, AI scams are very real and, and have to be. And I'm so glad that you're able to, to do that to protect yourself and your son. Um, I think we will see the rise of expert witnesses who specialize in metadata for deep fakes. Oh, yes. And if you're interested in law adjacent and you are techie, this is a field. This is a field to get into now and be an expert in. There is lots of money to be made in being an expert witness, and it is so needed. Good tech witnesses are so needed and will be needed in everything from criminal law to civil. You it will be needed. So if you are interested in not going to law school, but being law adjacent, this is the this is the area that will be needed. Um, Renee said, missed you over the weekend. Glad you were able to have a good family time. Thank you. Looking forward to all the upcoming content. Me too. Me too. Um, partner's grandparents got scammed a few years ago by calling, spoofing his voice. Company they sent money through flagged it. Thank God. Family passwords. Absolutely. And it's so easy. These kinds of things are so easy. Um, if one company names it Skynet, I'll be in a bunker. I was making a Skynet joke on the internet um, over the weekend with uh with i justine because on twitter now it says tweets sent from earth and i'm like are they trying to distinguish it from being sent from skynet or from like the elon musk's sky whatever internet i'm like why are they now saying from earth odd uh happy graduation kathleen fresh pa grad as of saturday whoop whoop taking a rest and studying for boards before studying for boards kick in take a rest and rest while studying for boards Best way to spend it feeling pretty damn lucky to be where I am. Congratulations. It's a testament to all of your work. Yay. Um, what's up with Miley's flowers versus Bruno Mars? Did she license anything? Love her, but uh, have been curious. I haven't seen. I know there's been a couple things going along with um, flowers, but I have not followed. So I will look. Just found out Friday I passed the California bar exam. Fearless Frappuccino. I think I said that correctly. Congratulations. The bar pass rates right now are so low in California that I think you're one of seven. So congratulations on passing the California bar. You've got this. And I know that you will be a credit to the profession. Call out the fuckery. Don't be afraid to ask questions and being tired is normal. And no, lawyers don't know what they're doing. We all figure it out. And yes, everyone uses Google sometimes. It's just knowing how to parse the fact from the fuckery that is really where the training comes in. Yay. Um, Tara, so justice for the dogs. I think the dogs just get blamed for everything. I'm kind of mad about it. <laughs> I'm just the poor dogs. Sorry, a bit behind my husband and I were on a date night one weekday night seven years ago. We came across Ed Sheeran working out um, one of his concert sets. It was an amazing 45 minutes that we'll never forget. That sounds incredible. Um, at the Santa Monica Pier. I mean, one of my favorite destinations to play Pokemon Go. Santa Monica Pier is where I heard uh, we were playing Pokemon Go and there was a vigorous debate going on about whether funnel cake could be vegan or not. And it was very interesting listening to them try to parse out the ways to make funnel cake vegan so that they could have funnel cake. EDB, you should rep Bubba pro bono. I mean, Bubba's reputation has been dragged through the mud and he's a hero. Thinking about how dogs might be worried about Gloria. I don't know. I don't know. What insurance company would take the money away from Gloria's family? None. And I don't think that they can. I think it's Alec being despicable, but it gives us a chance to put it in the news again and say, hey, look, Alec is being despicable. Even if Gloria tripped by accident, no dogs, wouldn't Alec still be responsible? No. So if if she tripped by accident or had a medical um, circ circumstance happen that caused her to trip, then no, he wouldn't necessarily be liable. Just if there's a true accident and on the property, it's not necessarily liability. Um, 
Kitty Van Cat said Mystic Seven Pogo YouTuber is always playing Pogo in Santa Monica. My boy watches him a lot. I've seen Mystic Seven out playing Pogo. I watch him in trainer tips um, to keep me in the loop on Pogo. And of course, there are others. But I love I love the Pogo uh, YouTubers. They're so much fun. Do you guys still watch Pogo YouTube? I, I appreciate that they still play. Um, even though there's times I am so, so tired of the game. Um, so there's times, there's times. I love seeing the travel videos um, that people do. Those are really fun. I love seeing them when they all get together at the different kind of Niantic events. That's really fun. So I I enjoy it quite a lot. So that's that's where I'm at with, with Pogo and playing Pokemon Go um, lately. How much did the boys get and when so far they've gotten over $7.5 million and they are entitled to another four. I don't know if they'll get all of it. Zoe two dots is ador adorable. Yes. Zoe two dots is amazing. And I love following, especially for community days because Zoe's in Australia. So Zoe gets stuff earlier. So I, I will go watch her videos to see if I want to leave my house to go play. Why are the dogs loose when everyone's sleeping? JP, you asked the real questions. Um, Celebrating justice for Ganon B2. Thank you for the uh, super chat for that. I know that um, I did not cover this case. If anyone wants to know why I did not cover the Leticia uh, Stotch case, is it Stotch or Staunch? I'm not quite sure. Go watch yesterday's sentencing. That's why I didn't cover the case. That the the type of pain that these uh, the families have been through that was caused in this case is too much for me to cover. But before the verdict came in, the judge's statement to the verdict was so fantastic. I need to go get a transcript of what the judge had to say, because the way that the judges, the way that the judge laid out the jury's role, honored the time that they took and also took a moment to say, it doesn't matter what anyone else says about this case. You've done your job. You've deliberated with others. You've come into this case um, with an open mind, you've heard the evidence, you've deliberated with each other. It was such a wonderful way to honor the jury and to also tell them before the judge knew their verdict, that your verdict is yours. Um, and, and that's okay. No one else could have done this, but you, I thought it was very, very, um, just on point and so well done. And one of the best ways I've seen a judge handle a high profile case telling the jury, look, whatever you decided, you're right. This is your verdict. You did this. You deliberated. Um, take that away. And I've honored the service that you've given here. Thank you for what you've given. This is not easy. And then also made um, made certain that he took time to talk to the juries about counseling and what counseling um, support services would be available, which I'm really glad to hear. But it's absolutely a heartbreaking case and even though trying to cover um that type of evidence is is difficult i know a lot asked i've seen it in comments here i've seen it in social media i've seen it all over um you didn't give commentary on this case there's not much commentary i can give i have a kid the same age i can't i can't and there's there's no there's nothing i can do that's helpful in that case other than cry and be angry and that's not how I want to spend a couple of weeks on the internet because I don't feel like it's a benefit for you or for me. So I'm going to keep catching up on these things um, because it is just too close. I worked as a prosecutor for too long and I've got to just keep those boundaries. So when it comes to little kids, it is very, very difficult. And that's that's why. And I've I know I don't have to explain, but I'm happy to explain where I know that a lot of you would like to watch it here with me and I would like to be with you too, but I, but I can't, um, the, the sentencing is heartbreaking. Absolutely heart, absolutely heart wrenching. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's so much pain and that's a really, really visceral thing. Alicia said, never thought it was the dogs, even more so after seeing the steps at the jury visit. The 911 call is so sketchy. It's a, it's a, the, I don't know if we'll ever be settled knowing what's going on with Gloria Satterfield. 
But at some point, the family has to move on, and they're going to, and I hope that they do. Gingy Prob said, I def, uh, deliberately took a law to break post Murdaugh, and I love that this is my first live back. You were like, here we are again. Does Alec Murdaugh's claim mean an automatic hold on money? No. Is this just vindictive? Maybe. Um, and I covered it more on Thursday if you want to go take a look. Um, LaDonna said, if they were asleep, who let the dogs out to begin with? I don't know, right? Could Alec have done this so that the insurance company get priority over the Satterfields and the bankruptcy since both would have judgments? Maybe. Maddie, that's a really good question. Because I wouldn't put it past him, would you? Maybe. Maybe. That would be interesting. Why is mom paying his housekeeper and it's the 21st century bank transfer the money? Well, it was 2018. I don't know. Maybe Gloria Satterfield rather be just paid with a check or come pick a check up or cash at the house. Um, you never know. So not worried about that. Kevin said, former firefighter, code one, no lights, no siren, code two lights, no siren, code three lights and siren. So he probably rolls code two, right? I don't think he has sirens. I think he just has lights. So probably code two. Thank you for that. Um, caught my dog having ripped open all my mulch bags and rolling in it while discussing dogs that are naughty. <laughs> Your dog is like, this is delightful. Dog. I mean, cats are definitely naughty too, but more in the like, oh, you really liked this? Hold on. Let me knock it off of the shelf for you and see if it breaks. Um, Where are Grady and Armadillo? In 2018, Grady and Armadillo were not there. Phoenix said he said she was sitting up when he got there and she had her legs on the steps and her head on the patio. What am I missing? He said her, I don't know how she was sitting up or if somebody propped her up because they did say she started to throw up and they were maybe trying to prop her up instead of rolling her on her side. But I don't know if at some point her legs came down off the steps, but it sounded like her legs and body were mostly up the steps, which explains the broken ribs. And then her head was just on the flat part at the bottom of the steps. So I don't know. Um, let's see. JP said my 80 year old grandpa got a lab puppy two years ago. I've paid 4k for two rounds of training because I'm afraid of her tripping him like this. She's still so nuts. And that's got to be hard too. as the owner of a six year old lab. They are affectionate. They are stubborn escape artists and they are not, not calm. I, um, I've almost tripped over my cats on the stairs because my cats are just like, Cincinnati said EDB. I was in Nashville for tea slift on Sunday. I'm sorry that you got the best of our spring weather. And my shoes will never be all the way dry. No, they won't. It was a late night. We did go to Adele's and it was absolutely incredible. Thank you for the suggestion. I'm so glad you liked Adele's. It's one of my favorite restaurants in Nashville. If you're looking for like a nice farm to table, delicious food, great drinks. It's a nice night out. It is so much fun. And it's so close to Broadway, but a nice little, uh, a nice little night out. It's absolutely fantastic. I had friends that were at the show on Sunday. They are all literally wet to the bone. I She played till like 2 a.m. or something. What a long night, but I'm glad they didn't cancel it. It was such um, a, dis a disappointment to people when they had to cancel Garth Brooks, but apparently we're getting a new stadium here in Nashville that is going to be covered or at least have a, a retractable roof, I think. So we will, um, we will not face these problems in the future, getting in and out of concerts like that. It took us like two and a half hours to get out and back onto the highway after the Rolling Stones, if not longer. It was wild. I don't think it'll be like that for Dave Matthews. But again, I'm not going to be leaving after Dave Matthews. I'm just going to be going, to, going down Broadway with my friends. I bought a shirt that said, Whiskey made me do it. I'm so thrilled. I'm ready for Dave. Um, Gingy Prob said, most unbelievable part of this story, AM left for work on time. Fair point. Very fair point. Emily, loving the shorter hair brings out the lovely purpleiness. I'm loving it too. It's really fun. I'm waiting for it to be just a little longer so it's easier to put up in a bun, but I'm loving it. We're going to keep it a little bit shorter. I don't know if I can keep the center part, though. Single space text is hard. All text is hard today. Good to see you, Rob. Um, Flux said, I do the maths every day as an accountant. Thanks for the distraction while I count other people's money all day. You're welcome. May they respond to your questions faster than I respond to my accountants. You think Alec has a foot in the insurance company? I don't think so. I think it would have been uncovered by now, but if he does, I'm, I trust that Eric Bland will uncover it. Can you please explain how to get into courtroom sketch artistry? I have no idea. I have a BFA and an MA. Thanks so much. There's a bunch of courtroom sketch artists on, um, 
on Twitter, I would reach out to some and ask. I don't know if you can just if you can just show up and do it. I don't know. I don't know. So for those of you that miss miss the bun, I miss the bun too. It'll be back. Don't worry. The messy bun will be back. Um, once we get just, I need to let it grow. I wanted to chop it, but once it gets a little bit longer, we can do it. Heavenly Light said, watching your channel inspired me to apply for a legal assistant job in the trucking company I work at. I got the position and I'm a month into it and I'm loving it. <laughs> Heavenly Light, cheers and congratulations. I love it. Question, EDB, why would uh, Alec Murdoch put the Satterfield boys down knowing they were made whole elsewhere? I don't know. It'd be a dick. It feels vengeful to me. And that's purely speculation. That is purely like gut speculation. Tony Satterfield testified against him at trial. Do I think that he wouldn't do that? No. It feels that way. Thank you, Jen Gerard, for the sweet, the sweet, um, the sweet birthday messages we are watching while boxing lip glosses. I am, I am wearing lip glosses. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, EDB, I know um, I joined late, but still learning something. Still learn something thanks to one of your mods. I now know my Stanley can hold a whole bottle of wine. They can. <laughs> I'm glad you've learned things, Rob. Welcome. I heard that you did like a seven hour stream on Friday. It's like seven hours in a hot tub or something. Shannon said pineapple is the snack that snacks back. It has enzymes that feed on protein, i.e. the inside of your mouth. It does snack back for me in a very unpleasant way. Question, who kept Bubba the dog? It was, um, oh, I'm going to blank on the name. She testified at trial. She ended up replacing Gloria Satterfield and seemed lovely. And I am absolutely blank. Blanca kept um, Bubba the dog. So Bubba is with Blanca. There we go. Steel City said, on what basis would those banks mentioned be required to pay the claim? What is their connection? Uh, they were part of the fraud. So they were part of the fake forge and they were part of um, of paying out. But I have not pulled up all of that case yet. So I want to get into it more deeply um, for sure. I played Pogo to connect with a kid over with the kid, not a kid. Sorry, that sounds way different if I say it that way with the kid over Pokemon. That's how I started playing Pogo. And then my kids don't want to play anymore. And I'm still like in <laughs> lawyer, you know, is covering the sentencing right now for those who want to see it. Fantastic. So if you want to see it, go, um, go take a look at lawyer, you know's channel as we wrap up here, they did the sentencing yesterday, but the, oh, the, the impact statements are very, very hard. So just, just a heads up. Did the Baja men let the dogs out? I think Maddie Graham, that's the only reasonable solution here. Carbon Ice Stardust, have you watched the new Dungeons and Dragons? No, but my kids want to. If not, why not? Time. Roll <laughs> persuasion before you answer. It's so good. I will. My kids want to go see it. Um, so we will absolutely be going to see it. We like going to the movies as a family. We very much enjoy it. It's just been time and we have end of the year stuff this weekend. And there's a... I don't know if it's a real rodeo or not, but there's a local rodeo this weekend. <laughs> I don't know, but I think we're going to be there. I think band is doing stuff at the rodeo. So we've got a busy weekend coming up, but we we try to balance time when the kids have stuff to do. One day a week, this is probably more information than any of y'all need. The kids like to have a, a down day. So if we have stuff to do on the weekend, the kids really want to have a down day at home. So we try not to do things both days. We need to let them homebody for a day after a week of school. Both of them need like to introvert, like recharge. They're both just ready for summer. Um, and I get it with the weather getting warm. My husband and I last night, it's part of why I was late recording the podcast. We had the, um, the screened in porch or the catio opened and went outside and I'm like, we have to just go for a walk. It is so nice out. And so it's that time of year where the evenings are starting to feel like summer evenings, but you still like your clothes don't stick to you yet. So I'm going to try to enjoy this time of year before it gets like um, hair frizz hot and and humid. It's starting to get like glowy skin humid, but not like disgusting humid. <laughs> I'm ready for it. I'm ready for this month to be amazing. So with that, you guys, it is time. We've been going for three hours. I will be... Um, I will be back on Thursday. Tomorrow, I'll be in the chat at 11 for the new podcast. You're welcome to download it. Um, audio, 
And I will see you Thursday. We will have lots of talk to talk about. We're going to be catching up on cases until the end of the month. And then, no, not the end of this month, the end of next month, we will be getting into um, the Idaho case. When there's answers in the Idaho case, we're just going to stay up to date with those filings. I'm very interested what happens. And I will be covering the next hearing on May 22nd live. So that'll be a rare Monday stream. I got to go block out calendars for stuff like that. And you guys, it sounds like Laura, you know, is still live. So you're welcome to head over there and say hello. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to do the YouTube things. Sign up for Law Nerd Alerts so you know on those random days when I'm like, hey, there's a hearing today. We're covering it. Law Nerd Alert will get you there. I have some exciting things that you will learn about on Law Nerd Alert. So if you want to know about things in advance um, and you are not a member, Law Nerd Alert is your best place to go. Even if you are a member, there is some stuff that just goes to Law Nerd Alert and you're going to want to know. We have some really exciting things coming up for you. Um multiple things. So we have merch things, we have collab things, we have notification system things, we have all kinds of things coming up. So make sure that you are signed up at Law Nerd Alert to be the first to know. And with that, everybody, I'm going to roll the outro and say goodbye. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a Law Nerd. Mods, thanks for riding. We got a little bit of a longer one today. I appreciate you. Sometimes it's just needed. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow in the chat and Thursday back on the live stream. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at The Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show, and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>